and to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have bodies at which any business affecting their interests is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of the Act, the 40 Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published on January 11, 2024, and posted on the district website at www.flboe.com, published in the Board's designated online media outlet, newspapers, the record in the Star Ledger, filed with the Clerk of the Borough of and then all persons, if any, who have requested said notice. Please be advised this meeting is being recorded and may be broadcast on local TV and online at a future date. The Open Public Meeting Act allows for remote participation at board meetings and defines meeting as any gathering, whether corporal or by means of communication equipment, which is attended by or open to all of the members of a public body, held with the intent on the part of the members of the body present to discuss or act as a unit upon the specific public, specific public business of that body. The purpose of tonight's special public business meeting is to convene in public session and then immediately proceed to close executive session to discuss personnel and legal matters. The board will return to public session at approximately 6.15 p.m. to hear public comments from the community and adjourn. Official action may be taken in the public session. Roll call, please. This is Bryce Kenny. Here. Ms. Colbach. Here. Ms. Curry. Here. Mr. Knight. Here. Mrs. Cotan. Here. Mr. Lopez. Here. Ms. Morrell. Here. Mr. Rubino. Here. Mrs. Richter. Here. The board will be convening to executive session to discuss legal and personnel matters. The board will reconvene into public session at approximately 6.15 p.m. I have a motion to go into executive session. Motion. Second. Motion Morrell, second Rubino. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, we are in executive session. law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice and to attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interests is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of the Act, the Forley Board of Education has caused notice of this special meeting to be published on March 11, 2024 and posted on the district website at www.flboe.com, published in the board's designated online media outlet newspapers, The Record, and The Star Ledger. Filed with the clerk of the borough of Fort Lee and mailed to all persons, if any, who have requested said notice. Please be advised this meeting is being recorded and may be broadcasted on local TV and online at a future date. The Open Public Meeting Act allows for remote participation at board meetings and defines meeting as any gathering, whether corporal or by means of communication equipment, which is attended by or open to all of the members of a public body held with the intent on part of the members of the body present to discuss or act as a unit upon the specific public business of that body. Excuse me, roll call, please. This is Byers Kent. Here. This is Colbach. Here. Ms. Curry. Here. Mr. Knight. Here. This is Cotang. Here. Mr. Lopez. Here. Ms. Morrell. Here. Mr. Rubino. Here. Mrs. Richter. Here. The board convened executive session at six o'clock today to discuss personnel and legal matters. Do board members have questions or comments on tonight's agenda or any other topic? I do. May I be recognized? I just said go ahead. Okay, I didn't hear you say that. Um, and I let me apologize to everyone. Um, I had a family vacation plan to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, so that's where I am. Um, I, I would much prefer to be there personally, in presence, with everyone. 
Um, so I, I plan at the appropriate time tonight, um, as was briefly discussed in private session, um, to make a motion that I hope will be supported to table uh, one POL tonight, pending two readings um, and review by the full board of a policy <laughs> that was circulated, policy 3319. Um, I know that there has been a lot of activity um, on social media and, and otherwise um, saying that the five of us that voted to repeal policy 5756, um, we've been labeled anti-LGBTQ, um, nothing could be further from the truth. You could look at all of our records for decades. It, I've been attending meetings for about 20 years. I've been on the board for almost 10. There's absolutely no basis for anyone to accuse any of us of, of being anti-LGBTQ. Um, the accusations and, and threats that have made been made against us, labeling us, are just simply counterproductive in a situation like this. Um, they gave the district an unnecessary black eye. Um, we are and will always be a superlative school district, safe, inclusive, and supportive. Um, five of us listened to the public. We read the 17 letters that were given to us. Um, we at the time, and we, we stated it, I, anyone looks at the video, the policy was discretionary and had flaws. We rolled up our sleeves and come up with something as close to the policy 5756 as we can that addresses the concerns that were raised. We don't think that anyone in the public or on the board, our community staff administration should have any issues whatsoever with the changes. And we welcome you know, your feedback and, and thoughts on that. Uh, we've named the, the new policy 3319 in honor of Transgender Day of Visibility, which was initially founded on March 31st, 2009. Um, these regulations and our policy for me, and I speak for myself, are kind of a prime example of something where Trenton passed something with very good intentions, but they don't always fully take into account the practical realities of how running a school actually happens. Um, as I reported, the policy committee met and I gave a report at our last meeting about the limitations that, and I spoke at, at that meeting before repealing, about the limitations that our district has, our administration has advised us about in terms of certain aspects of the policy. Um, and so some of the changes that are reflected in the revision um, take into account what our administration has reported to us. Um, for me, I'm a lawyer, to have a policy that we cannot live up to and honor is a recipe for disaster and a lawsuit. So um, the, the changes that, that we have here um, don't take into account all of the concerns that, that were raised um, in, in all the material. It, it doesn't into, you know, address things like our students traveling to other districts and what our obligation is. Um, when a parent requests to see records, what happens? And, and I would like to see something much more um, descriptive. Um, we have an AOF program where we actively seek to employ high school students with work papers. It doesn't address uh, how we're going to deal with that. Um, parent involvement in IEPs. If I happen to have signed many, many IEPs, and I would hope that um, there wouldn't be some separate IEP that I'm not part of um, and one that I would have signed during my son's from kinder, actually pre-K to grade in Fort Lee. I mean, there, there, so there were more than 12 of them. Um, so again, I plan to make a motion to table it. Hopefully we will have the first reading on our meeting on Monday night. Um, but this, this, is, this policy um, takes into account concerns 
issues that were raised by all of our constituents. And I would hope that the full board would give serious consideration to the new policy. Do any other board members have comments or questions? Good evening. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, President. Um, and thank you for all the parents and uh, community members who took time tonight to come here to voice your opinion, to make time to support um, our community. So thank you very much for that. Um, I have a very different recollection of the policy committee, committee meeting um, from February 26th, I believe that was the day, um, then Ms. Paula had, uh, Pobeth had described. So I'm here to share with you my recollection of that uh, meeting with our council and, uh, and, and some personal statement that I would like to make tonight. Mrs. Goldstein, just before you go, I just may, um, <laughs> committee meetings uh, are exempt from the provisions of the Open Public Meetings Act. Um, so they are in a formal board meeting where the public does not have a right to be at a public uh, committee meeting. Uh, minutes technically do not have to be kept of a committee meeting, but it is best practice to keep some semblance of minutes. Um, but to the extent that you're going to report out what occurred at that meeting, you reference council was present. So just please refrain from disclosing anything that touches upon any attorney client privilege communications at that meeting. So therefore, any questions that you or any board member or administrator may have raised to my partner, Chris Buggy, um, any response or advice he may have given, Please do not disclose that because that would be a violation of the attorney client privilege. So, talk so about anything except for what was kind of communicated by Ms. Reed and Council. Okay. So, on February, on Monday, February 26, members of the Fort Lee Board of Education Policy Committee, Chairperson Paul Kobath, Ali Morrell, myself, and the Board of Ed President Kristen Rector met to discuss and consult with the Board Council. Dr. Robert Kravitz and Ms. Diane Baker to understand the application of policy 5756 and 9940. In this meeting, there was no discussion of any amendments to either of these policies, nor any discussion of repealing either of these policies. The policy committee is the designated venue to discuss amendments or repeal of district policies, particularly those that give guidance on how to be in compliance with the New Jersey law against discrimination. In this meeting, the Fort Lee Board of Education, of, of Education Council had discussed the implication of removing policy 5756. This is the, pol the only policy in place right now to help school guide school personnel to address harassment for transgender students. At least four school districts in New Jersey are engaged in litigation with the state's over proposed change to the policy or replacement policies. Policy 5756 was adopted in 2015 and revised most recently in 2019 with no reported negative effects since then. In short, it's a long-standing policy in, in, it's a long-standing policy in good standing. The policy was designed to protect students from discrimination and is aligned with the federal and state laws. There were several statements that were made at the last board meeting to which I would like to respond and rectify from my perspective. Statement number one, there were upwards of 30 schools, not nine, that have repealed the policy. According to a recent report, less than a dozen districts tend to be exact in New Jersey that have adopted their policy, that have dropped their policies protecting the privacy and accommodation of transgender students. Only 10 out of 620. This is contrary to the claim that upward 30 schools have repealed the policy. Again, 10, not 30. Repealing is not a best practice. Correction number two. On the March 4th meeting, it was cited that policy 8486 
with these words. The case that was referred to by Attorney General Matthew Plankins against the Hanover District relating to a totally different policy. Furthermore, the court says you can repeal it and the government will not require you to reinstate. First, policy 8463 is not a totally different policy. It is a replacement policy for 5756 that outs gay students and transgender students. Second, the judge in that same case noted, also noted that districts ignoring the state guidance risk violations of the law. A material fact that was omitted at that meeting, at the last meeting, and it has significant and serious legal risk implication for our district. Correction number three, a claim was made that policy 5657 is in conflict with policy 9200, 9230, and 9240, and therefore cannot co co coexist. Policy 9240s made it clear that every parent except as prohibited by federal and state law shall have access to records and information pertaining to his or her emancipated child. State law in this case would include the New Jersey law against discrimination, making it compatible and not in conflict. Correction number four, regarding due process, we take a child's word as gospel. There has to be more. This policy simply does not take a child's word as gospel. In fact, it does not prevent school staff from sharing, period. Parents retain their rights. The policy reads as follows. Due to a specific and compelling need, such as the health and safety of a child or an incident of bias-related crime, the school district may be obligated to disclose a student's status during her of harassment, intimidation, or bullying investigation. The school district is obligated to develop a procedure to report verbally and in writing an act of harassment, intimidation, and bullying committed by an adult on a youth against a student pursuant to New Jersey AC, AC 6A 17-77A28. In this incidence, the principal or designated destiny shall inform the students of the school's application to report the findings of harassment, intimida intimidation, and bullying investigation, which permits the parent of the students who are party to the investigation to receive information about the investigation in accordance with federal and state law and regulation. Under harassment, intimidation, and bullying legal requirements, parents are entitled to know the nature of the investigation, whether the district found evidence of harassment, intimidation, or bullying, or whether disciplinary action was imposed or services provided to address the incident of harassment, intimidation, or bullying. So as a member of the policy committee, I would like to underscore the motion to rescind policies 5756 is, is, was done without consultation of the majority member of the policy committee and trusted to steward all policies for this district. This is at best, at best inappropriate and at worst irresponsible. The motion to rescind policy 5756 is being rushed. This, this very meeting you're sitting in right now, requested by five members of the board, has an anticipated cost of $709 per hour for the first hour and an incremental cost of $270 thereafter per hour. Our next meeting was supposed to be in three working days. Instead, we pay $700 for the first hour and close to 300 every subsequent hours. This is for our security, our IT, AV support, our staff, and this is not taking into account our leadership that are set here and the volunteer time of the board. The time commitment are given freely and willingly. Our resource is not endless. No, it is not. And it's not the best use of our district's resource. The motion to rescind 
policy 5756 is being rushed despite the consequential legal exposure of the district and risk to students, as well as responsibilities explained to us and stated by the state Supreme Court Justice. The rush to ideology has no place in our district and needlessly expose our students and school to risk. We are a community that values thoughtful consideration without needless risk for kids and for our schools. The motion to resent 5756 and more recently to introduce the idea in the community of a replacement policy without consultation of the major of the majority members of the policy committee and without consultation of stated recommended child specialists, educators, and others is at best responsible, irresponsible, and the worst reckless. On drafting a replacement or amended policy, please note that as members of the board, we have no expertise in child development, no expertise in health, mental health, no expertise in consideration of the LGBTQ community, and none of us have the potential and experience as K-12 educators. 5756 was studied publicly, reviewed and recommended by a panel of specialists and educators and people with life experience, life and lived experience. Policy 5756 is a set of tools to help rank and file school employees or even a higher ranking administrator for that matter, know what the law against discrimination required by way of transgender accommodation, a vote to repeal leads to consequential legal risk exposure, and more importantly, risk for students. The New Jersey Attorney General stated the repeal of policy 5756 will eliminate critical protection. We repeat, the removal and repeal of policy 5756 will eliminate critical protection for students. I conclude with the underscoring. The Board of Education adopted 5756 to ensure that Fort Lee School provide a safe and supportive learning environment that is free from discrimination and harassment for transgender students. The rash move by certain board members to repeal the policy without appropriate due process puts our student and our school at risk. We are a community that values thoughtful considerations and putting above all the safety of our students. We receive the amendment at 4.30 today. So if you're not doing anything between 4.30 and 6, you would have read it. It is a five-page document. We appreciate the offer for it to be reviewed longer. I plan to make a motion tonight for these policy, for the, for the amendments to be sent to our policy committee to be reviewed. Because there's no other time where we can ask questions and share and set up a training process for everyone so that it can be given considerable weight to match the gravity of this policy. I hope the full board would make the decision to support this and allow for the policy committees to do its work. Thank you. We could have gone to the policy committee with this. I do. Um, the policy committee, well, that was a very respectful way. The policy committee um, did meet about this and they discussed it. And the policy committee, which consists of three people who were adamantly pro 5756 as it existed, liked the idea. And the one person that was put on the committee that was against it didn't like the idea. So nothing. That nothing was ever going to come out of that committee other than what did come out of it. You know, we we attempted to we attempted to speak about this a few times, and, and we were sort of I don't want to get into specifics, but we weren't necessarily um, we weren't entertained, I should say. So what we've done is last week when we had the meeting, we listened to the to the public outcry. We, we read all the letters. 
You know, we listened to Stasi who stood at the podium. You know, we listened to Hudson, and and we were touched by it. I mean, we were moved by it, and and we decided that we wanted to come up with an idea for something that everyone could get behind, that everyone truly could get behind, and we decided to go with language that was as close to the language of 5756 as possible. And as a matter of fact, and we can send it out to anyone who'd like to see it, we've actually marked what's new green, what we removed red, and we brought it down to a literal single issue. The single issue is whether or not elementary school children should have completely separate records, if completely separate records should be established at each six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's the only issue. Every single, everything else stays the same. Every protection that's in this policy stays the same. Teachers are gonna be able to have conversations, they're gonna be private, the law protects, and I, and I welcome, I understand people are upset, and I understand there's a lot of um, emotion here, but I welcome everyone to take a look at this because it, it is definitely something that I think the majority of people can get behind. You know, we as a community, we have to compromise. We have to find something that's gonna work for everyone. And, and I think, you know, again, I'm going to say their names again, Stasi and, and Hudson, they, I think they painted a really good picture for us of, of what our children need and what they want, and, and we did our absolute best to ensure that they'll get that. Again, the only change in this policy that's substantial is that the record, that there will not be separate records kept for children in the elementary school. So. Again, I feel horrible that this came about this way. It, it certainly wasn't ideal by any stretch of anyone's imagination. But I want everyone to know that the people that voted last time to repeal it, repeal was never our goal. It was, it was a means to get a, a seat at the table and, and to get a chance to, to address the community and to speak to the community, to listen to the community. And, and that's what we did. And I think when you read this, which you haven't, you know, also we're not pushing it through. We're not voting tonight on it. We're getting a first read on this on Monday, as far as I know. Um, so there's been one change. So I welcome everyone to take a look at it. And, and again, if anyone wants to reach out to me with any concerns they have, I'm happy to, to listen and to try to incorporate that into, you know, into any subsequent proposals that we come up with. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on this matter. Uh, the timing of, of this motion raised uh, several concerns. One, uh, over the past couple of months, uh, the high focus of the board has been on addressing some of the critical issues. Uh, to mention a few, teacher retention, open positions, and infrastructure repairs. We appreciate that additional items do require attention as we're in the initial months of a new board, new leadership. We aim to keep these items at the center of attention, and we, keep the, we aim to keep these items at the center of attention. We're much better served maintaining our focus, advocating on these issues, impacting our student body on a daily basis. Two, we risk intensifying the anxiety and stress some students are currently dealing with. College acceptance letters, financial aid, and SAT prep. And three, any decision made on this topic opens the district up to possible legal repercussions, leading to potential costly lawsuits at taxpayer expense, something I'm not comfortable doing so. I much prefer investing in hard-earned taxpayer money on enhancing educational resources, improving facilities, or supporting programs within our district that will better prepare our court EU for tomorrow. As a new board member, I've come to learn a whole lot in a short period of time. I believe it's important that we prioritize the welfare of all of our students. Above all, our focus is to create a safe environment where every student and faculty member feels valued and supported. In addition, it provides guidance for our valued teachers. I propose moving this uh, to the policy committee uh, so that we can truly, it can truly be evaluated and reviewed. A decision that requires thought and meaningful dialogue deserves better judgment and a better process. Thank you. Hi, good evening everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And um, I would like to say that this was never in any intended way to affect people in the high school. And I do apologize 
for all of the heartbeat fitness has caused. Um, I'm speaking not from something that I've written, I'm speaking from my heart. Um, I was newly elected to this position and I believe something around 2,200 and something people voted for me. And I ran on a platform where I looked people in the eyes and I shook their hands and it said, um, I said to them, we spoke about these policies, these are parents in the district, these are people in the district. So this was, this was something that was very high on the list of uh, things to be looked at. Um, I understand and I see that taking this policy away for high school students and um, older students is not something that would be beneficial to those students. Um, but I, at the lower levels for me, the parents that I spoke to, the people that voted for me, I, I have an oath to uphold. So I, I know I'm not speaking as clearly as I would like to, but I'm speaking from my heart when I say that this is um, a hard place to be because the votes were there. And um, I know that the, the room is has people in it and people are going to speak on a certain, how they feel. Um, but I hope that as a board, that we can all come together really and put all, all of our differences aside and do what is best for all of the students. I, I, as I'm explaining to you, I have no bad intentions or want to infect, uh, affect any student in a negative way. There are parents, many parents, the ones that went to the polls that have concern at the younger ages about this policy. And if there is a way that we could come together to make it happen, for everybody, um, however that has to be, that would be a huge blessing. And that's all I have to say, thank you. Um, I just wanna make a few clarifying points and then add a few pieces of information. Um, so the policy committee is made up of three people and then I as president sit on it, just like I sit on every committee. So there were two people who voted in favor of keeping the policy 5756 and one who was against it. So um, I just wanted to make that point clear. Um, the policy committee meeting was called so that the newest member of the committee and one of the newest members of the board could ask questions to our legal counsel um, and have a better understanding of the policy before we had the open discussion last week in public. And not once in any conversation ever was it mentioned that people had ideas to amend any policy or create a new one that would work for everyone. Um, I also just want to point out that a policy created to only protect older students and to not provide the younger students who may be experiencing the same things. Um, the New Jersey laws against discrimination protect everyone of all ages, not just students from grades seven through 12. So anyone who falls under whatever age range would be mentioned in a new policy. We owe it to all students to offer them the same protections. Um, our code of ethics that we signed in January Letter C states, I will confine my board action to policy making, planning, and appraisal, and I will help to frame policies and plans only after the board has consulted those who will be affected by them. I don't recall any public forum where people sat down with anyone that this policy affects, students, teachers, or parents, so just wanted to make that clear. Um, also. We have been hearing public comments at the last meeting about how, um, you know, our staff isn't equipped, we need to hire trained professionals. We have a school counseling department and a child study team that consists of 13 counselors, an intermediate school and a middle school social worker, a high school social worker, a district student assistance counselor, 
a child study team made up of six school psychologists, two full-time social workers, two part-time social workers. And while they don't operate under these licenses during the school day, many of these social workers are licensed social workers, licensed clinical social workers, and licensed professional counselors. I think we have very well-trained employees. <laughs> And lastly, I have a lot of questions about all this red in this new proposed policy, including the bullet points highlighted in red that states a transgender student shall be allowed to dress in accordance with the student's gender identity. If we are abolishing that, now we're enforcing how these students are allowed to appear at school. I'm not okay with that. Thank you. Any other board members have comments? Okay, may I have a motion? Yes, I would like to. I would like to respond to a couple of comments that were made, um, that that were directed to me. That um, first, that it was inappropriate, and I was irresponsible for voting what I believe to be in the best interest of our students because I didn't propose changes at a policy committee meeting. I think if you all would tell the public exactly how I asked many, many questions. It was apparent to everyone at that committee meeting that I had serious issues about certain provisions. The fact that sometimes you have to take into account the practical realities of the situation you were in. And I could, we could have filibustered and spent another hour me proposing changes that would not have been productive, especially since some of the changes that are being proposed are as a result of public comment on the policy, which the committee doesn't didn't make any recommendations one way or the other. I have always been of the mind, you know, that I didn't think that a policy committee would be productive in, in this particular situation because this, this policy, there are differing views and inputs. And I thought from minute one, it should be a full board discussion so that the committee didn't receive legal information or have a private discussion. I said from the start, all board members should have been privy to everything that was discussed, stated, asked, all information from the policy committee. Um, I gave a report. It's a matter of public record. People could go on the website, I would hope, and, and look at the, the committee minutes. I read my minutes, all of the issues that were discussed, and I don't believe Holly, Amy, or Kristen took issue with anything that I reported. I did it very specifically at the last meeting. I actually attached my report to, to the committee form oh, yeah. so we can go and look at what was discussed at the committee. If, if this needs to go through the, the, a technical committee process, I would propose that the committee meet on March 15th, Monday at 6 p.m. before the regular meeting. If this it, it, it is that critical and important, I assume everyone will make time to make that meeting. Yes. Do we have a confirmed committee meeting? Do we have, yeah, we'll discuss it before the meeting on Monday? Yeah, we'll open the meeting. I mean, I have no problem meeting on. Mike cannot hear you. Yes, I'm available on March 15th, 530 p.m., is that right? Okay, then. I think I think 6 p.m., but but 5.30 would be fine as well. No, Paula it's March 18th. It's Monday the 18th. Monday the 18th. Okay. Yeah, what, our next meeting, if it's the 18th, I'm going by memory. I apologize. I'm on ski time. We can do this when we're not paying for it. Amy, if you could use the mic, because I didn't hear. I just heard that it was your voice. schedule our meeting when we're not paying for people here. <laughs> I want 
to be able to have a whole discussion as an entire board like we did at Monday night's meeting about policy. You know, everyone voiced their questions or concerns about any policy in place um, or proposed because obviously the policy committee isn't going to be meeting with each individual board member to answer questions Doug might have or Tanya might have. So I have no problem meeting before the meeting, but I also want to have conversation once other board members have been able to digest the proposed policy so that their questions can be asked as well. You want to have a meeting by 30, private or six? We can't talk about the policy in private. No, uh, Mike, it would take place during our public meeting on Monday night. Thank you, that's what I just said. Okay, may I have a motion to open the floor to the public? Motion. Motion morale, second, second night, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed or abstentions? Okay, we will hear first from members of the public that are physically located in the cafetorium tonight. Then we will take questions and comments from those participating remotely. Participants are limited to three minutes to make their statement. If warranted, a response will be given after the three minutes. For remote participants, please select the raise hand button. District Tech Coordinator, Mr. Ruggiero, will recognize each community member in order to raise hands by lowering the hand. Please unmute your microphone, then state your name, home address for the record, and begin your comments. Please limit your comment to three minutes. Please, members in the public, please also state your full name and home address for the record. Mr. Sarno. Thank you, President Richter, David Sarno, 5 Horizon Road. Um, th thank you, board members. Um, President Richter, I just want to say I, I watched Monday's meeting, and I just want to recognize you for how you conducted that meeting. And, 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 I, I was a little perplexed when the notice of the special meeting was brought to my attention. First of all, why there was a special meeting with a regularly scheduled meeting so close um, on the calendar. But in the, in the notice, it said the board would open public and immediately go into executive session to discuss the abolishment of policy 5756 personnel and legal matters. Now, President Richter, when you opened the meeting, you said the board returned after discussing personnel and legal matters. And I'm so glad that members of the board said we can't discuss policy in executive session. Um, but for very few exceptions dealing with legal issues or pending litigation. So I would like to know, and I'm sure the public would like to know, was there discussion of policy 5756 in executive? If so, are minutes or a summary of that discussion going to be made public? Because I've been going to Board of Ed meetings for 17 years. I served on this board for six years. I was board president for three years. I was the board president when policy 5756 was enacted by unanimous board vote. And no objection stated at that time or subsequently after as far as I knew. But I, again, policy should not be discussed in executive session. My opinion, that's an end run around the open public meetings requirements. So will a summary be made of what was discussed um, in executive session about this policy? And going forward as a best practice, policies should be debated. And, and I'd also like to address something Mr. Knight raised and, and Paula. Committee process is set up for a reason. It's not for everybody to always agree. It's messy. Um, if anybody ever sat on a committee, may he rest in peace with Joe Serrace, you would know that where you began was a different place from where you ended. And we need to engage more in dialogue, in thoughtful debate, in not demonizing each other to arrive at sound policies for this district. So I won't take up any more of your time. And it's a shame that members of the Fort Lee Police Department needed to be here for no reason since there is no substantive discussion on this policy to begin with that couldn't happen on Monday. Thank you. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Howard Lipoff. I live at 161 Main Street in Little Falls, 
and I'm the treasurer of the Fort Lee Education Association. I want to point to uh, Paula Kopeff's point about a black eye to this district, she said. And I think what's happened over the last week and a half is there's been a lot of negative publicity or negative talk about this district because of a board which, whether you believe it or not, is viewed as starting to be an extremist board of education, out of line with all the other, out of line with almost all the districts. And there are many districts, I think over 600 in the state of New Jersey. Now, it was not just because of this policy on transgender youth. Um, at the end of the meeting, when um, after the vote you had on that, and I was leaving, many people leave, I went, when I watched the video, I saw that there was the majority of the board, it was a split vote, the majority of the board voted against um, some training, some professional development that the superintendent had recommended, which would explore the principle, and I'm just reading from what's what it said on the agenda, explore the principles of culturally responsive teaching. Now the cost um, was $300, which I guess is a lot less than this meeting tonight. <laughs> And it would seem to me that this goes in to say that the board or the majority of the board is going to be extreme. It, it seems that this would be something that everyone would support. So I would like to ask the members of the majority of the board, they were the same exact people who voted against the transgender policy or for changing it or abolishing it, I would like one or more of them to explain why they would not want the staff here to explore the principles of culturally responsive teaching. Thank you. Sand Spawn, 33 Center Street, Pompton Lakes, New Jersey. I'm Sand Spawn, Middle School Library Media Specialist and President of the Fort Lee Education Association, also known as FLEA, representing over 450 teachers, paraprofessionals, secretaries, custodians, and other certified school professionals in the Fort Lee School District. As public school employees, we are dedicated to providing the best educational experience to all students within this community, regardless of race, ethnicity, or gender identity. We are proud of Fort Lee's rich diversity and welcoming nature, and we strive to embrace those qualities within our classrooms and throughout our schools. Additionally, as public school employees, we are charged with upholding all board policies, state statutes and laws governing this district as our administration and board of education. These policies, statutes, and laws are in place to support and protect children physically, socially, and emotionally as they navigate their school years and grow to become fully functioning members and future leaders of our society. Any change or modification must be carefully considered and more importantly, seek to uphold the greater good rather than appease a select few. <laughs> For at least schools are the heart of our community. They bring out the best in our children. And when that happens, they bring out the best in all of us. Any policy change that marginalizes a segment of our population serves no purpose except to weaken our schools, which in turn weakens our community. It's 
it's with that in mind that Flee the Fort Lee Education Association urges you to rethink and reject any attempt to erode our collective heart and instead protect the inclusivity that makes Fort Lee the place to be. Thank you. I'm Brad Raimondo. I live at 2298 Lemoyne Avenue. What are we doing here? <laughs> We've heard our schools have pressing needs, facilities, <laughs> teacher vacancies, updating our math and ELA curricula. None of that's worth a special work session of the Board of Education. But we've called a special work session of the Board of Education to talk about abolishing a civil rights policy. Oh, but maybe not. No, everyone calm down. We've got a replacement policy ready to go. You can't see it yet. The board members <laughs> only got to see it after 4 p.m. today. The policy committee hasn't met on it. The board hasn't had the opportunity to speak to the board attorney about its legal ramifications. I'll tell you what, a member of the board did, a member of the board in support of this so-called replacement policy did email it to me a little bit before it was shared with the rest of the board members. So I can tell you, in case the board hasn't had a chance to read it, that the claim that the only change in this proposal has to do with student records is simply untrue. This is not the way responsible people make policy. But over, over and above that, the simple truth is that five people on this board made a mistake nine days ago. You made a mistake when you voted to authorize the repeal of 5756. And in making that mistake, you not only rejected the advice of the panel of child development experts, educators, and members of the transgender community who advised the State Department of Education on the creation of that policy. In making that mistake, you sent a message of callousness, yes, of callousness, to the LGBTQ youth of Fort Lee and to all of those who genuinely love and support them in action and not just in words. The good news is now you can make it right. At a time when coast to coast, we see state after state, community after community, passing laws and policies to roll back LGBTQ civil rights, to push young people back into the closet, to restore people to the second class citizenship that so many have fought to overcome, you could say clearly and definitively, not here, not in Fort Lee. Here we love and support and protect the civil rights of our LGBTQ youth, every single one of them. Here we do not put up a sign that says, you must be this tall to exercise your civil rights. <laughs> Tonight, you can vote to table the motion to abolish, and you can make the decision to move on and leave 5756 alone. And I just like to start by saying that. Please, your, your address, please. Oh, my address, um, Tom Hunter Road. I don't have to give you my exact address, do I? No. <laughs> I mean, I live in Fort Lee. So, what do you want, Tom Hunter Road? If that's such a problem. But I mean, I've dealt with the school. Get closer to the mic, sir. Could you get closer? I'm having a hard time hearing you. Yeah, Thank I've you. dealt with the school counselors before, and my own personal experience, it was awful. But I'm just going to say that right now. I just like to get into talking about policy 57, 56, and that person. Um, okay, so today most of us all felt the need to come to this meeting today to fight for what we believe is right. Now, there's no doubt that everyone's going to have their own difference in opinions. Although, when we're coming for my future children's rights and the rights of the young children in Fort Lee, then I have a problem. What happened to only caring about education? It seems that you people are so fixated on one thing and that's only coming for the kids. I mean, we were just talking, somebody who just came up here talking about um, the, the civil rights and your height. I mean, your height doesn't matter about what civil rights. If you know, no kid no understands civil rights. Like, 
You're going to tell a little kid that he understands his own sexual identity at such a young age. At six, when you were six years old, you understood who you are really as a person, and you could give a firm, I mean, idea to anybody that you knew who you were as a little kid. And you, and when you were seven or eight, I hope that your parents would let you go up to a teacher and talk to them about something as serious as this. And this is this adult conversation. So. I just like to go into saying that it seems that you people are so fixated on one thing, and that's only coming for the kids who, mind you, only know what the hell any of this is because you have decided to push these adult ideas on their valuable lives. And let's talk about what's keeping this policy in place to close. Now we're talking about giving the teachers the power to feel that they are allowed to speak to the students about whatever the student wants. We are essentially giving the students and the teachers power over mothers and fathers. Allowing this policy to stay in place can also cause a dangerous environment for our schools. It's not like we haven't seen cases of predatory acts against young, confused children. These teachers are giving the kids positive affirmations about their mental confusion and telling them that they aren't really the sex that they think they are. No child is thinking in an adult way like you or me when they speak about feeling like a girl or a boy. Now let's picture this, a young girl, let's call her Sarah. Sarah comes to her teacher saying that she wants to be like Mikey. She says how she wants to ride skateboards and hang out with his friends. And now a, teach, now a teacher can give this very confused child the choice to make an adult decision. This now creates a dangerous place for the child with the teacher that is taking advantage of a young child's mind. So I just like to say that this has really affected me in a great way. I mean, sometimes I just can't even stop thinking about this. And to see that my peers are supporting this is truly saddening. All right, thank you for having me. Morrell, 24 Summit Avenue, Hackensack, New Jersey. So hello, board. My name is Michael Morrell, and my pronouns are he, him, and his, for your information. I founded the GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance, in Fort Lee High School over 10 years ago, and upon finding out that there's a meeting happening today, I found out that I need to come today to continue fighting for the LGBTQIA plus rights of our Fort Lee school, uh, school, board, uh, school district kids. As I stated back then, the safety of our kids is in our own hands, yours, the towns, and the schools. That includes the mental and emotional health of our LGBTQ uh, and uh, QI plus kids. Now I could stand here, as Ms. Colbath said earlier, and call you all bigots and transphobes, but that would not be conducive to this meeting at all. However, I would like to give you uh, information, or rather an education, briefly on some very key things that I think you should be taking in consideration when voting. According to multiple studies and on the Human Rights Campaign website, many trans people regret not coming out at a much younger age and that they had wished they had the support of both their parents, the school, and society, which is rather ironic because we have all three here with us tonight to freely express who they are as a person. It's been proven that they then grow into healthier, uh, uh, more productive adults in their earlier, in their later years. Listen, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network has also conducted a study. And upon those results, they found that the trans students received even more hostile treatment within the school district than the other LGB, uh, the LGBTQ uh, students do. So take that into consideration. Listen, the Gay Lesbian uh, Straight Education Network, they conducted a study, and within the LGBT group of students, the trans students receive even more hostility than the typical gay, uh, gay lesbian or bisexual student does. So take that into consideration. As a gay student that went through this, student, this, this school district, I can tell you, it was not easy. There weren't many policies just 10 years ago protecting us. I received harassment from the age of six. Just so everybody understands. I would also like you guys to know that New Jersey is only one of five states in the entire country that has laws requiring us to teach about these specific uh, studies. 
what if one, one of five states out of 50? Please take that in consideration. Thank you. Need to adjust this. <laughs> this is my little down. Hold that down. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Julianne Chan. I'm a Fort Lee High School student. I live on uh, North Block. Hi. Hi. Hey, I remember you. I remember you. Okay. I lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just your address. Huh? Your address. Oh, yeah. Uh, North Central Road. Uh, a lot of the other members of the public have, have already addressed important issues like protecting, protecting LGBT students, the uh, importance of staff and, student, and giving students guidance and the importance of inclusion. But I'm here to address how repealing this policy will interfere with education. Some people might think that, that school is a daycare, but we don't. High schoolers are here to learn. When I was in sixth grade, I mean six years old, all I really wanted to do was learn how to pronounce the word specific. My brother at the age of nine, he's right now doing his math homework, doing fractions. And yes, parental rights are important. Parents have a right to know how their children are doing. Reporting of bullying, release of educational material, reporting of mental health crisis, they are all outlined under different policies like 5350, 5512, and 8385. <laughs> so what happens if you repeal 50? I mean, 47, 57, 56. Well, say a student goes to a trusted teacher, confides about their identity, and the teacher becomes required to tell that student's parents, breaching their trust. And I'm scared this is going to snowball. I'm scared that this means if a student goes to a counselor at any age, talks about anything, that's, that's going to snowball into that staff member being required to tell the teacher, I mean, they're the parents about anything, like from friend drama, religious idealism, the, the fact that you dislike broccoli, you name it, it's getting reported. And it's, what does this mean for education? Look, I'm taking into account the practicalities of running a school that you were talking about. Will teachers have to report every single thing they see in the hallway to parents? Will classes have to just stop so teachers can observe what students do in their time? That's not education, that's daycare. School, even elementary school, isn't daycare. School's supposed to be a place where we can learn to think for ourselves. And this can't happen if everyone is so caught up monitoring, reporting behaviors every which way, especially in elementary school. How will anyone learn and grow into becoming a responsible and educated member of today's world? So please think about the longevity of education and society. Thank you. and LA 201 Bluff Road. That was great. Um, so I just, can you hear me? I just want to say a couple of things. So the board, I, you know, the board knows I sent them a letter earlier this week. And I'm not going to repeat all of it, but I'm going to repeat one paragraph of it. But what I want to say right now is that words matter. The words we use matter. There's been a lot of words like social transition, transition, that is not what we are talking about here. We are talking about giving our students a safe environment for them to go to if their home is not where they feel comfortable sharing important things about their life. And you know what? I have an eight and a 10 year old and I was asked this week by one of you, would I want to know? Of course I would want to know. Of course I would want to know if they were thinking about this. Of course I would hope they would come to me. But if they didn't feel safe, if I exhibited some characteristic that they didn't think they, they could come talk to me about, you're damn right I want them to go to the trusted adults in their life, which are at their feet. <laughs> the elementary school example and what's being said now about the fact that elementary school kids may be out of this, I find very rich given that it was an elementary school grade that was, you, that was, it was the example of a first grader given last week, right before the vote, as why this policy was getting repealed. Yet now, all of you guys don't want to do that. I mean, it's, it's just rich that when you hear the public outcry, all of a sudden, our opinions have changed. I'm going to read one paragraph from the email I sent earlier this week. 
where the policy protects our children is when they are most vulnerable, confused in their most vulnerable and confusing stages of their life, in their teenage years and the rest of their life, frankly, but where the brain is not fully developed yet and they are beginning to move into adulthood, where their identity is forming and when we as supportive parents and a supportive community. What makes this place great, and now I'm going off the letter, but what makes this place great is that I could leave my eight-year-old running into the gym for, for um, for basketball, and I know that there's 15 people I know in that building, and they can, and, and they're going to look after me while I'm parking the car. What makes this place great is the fact that we lean on each other as a community, and that is what this policy is intended to do, and what repealing it will take away. We do not know what goes on behind closed doors. We would like to make grandiose statements that everyone here in Fort Lee would never act in a way that they would never abuse their children. That we do not know. We don't know, and when we don't know, we support everybody do not repeal this policy do not limit it to elementary school this this is it's a mistake and you the good people of this town it is a mistake i'm mickey patrillo i live at Linwood park and i am a trans man i don't know if there's anybody else here who is trans so I'm here to speak for the trans community. I do a lot of work with children, young adults, and I see a lot of cis people here making decisions for my community, which I don't think is right without asking us, okay? A five-year-old who I've talked to, to 90-year-olds. Five-year-olds do not have the capacity. Yes, they might think they are girl, boy, whatever I did at five but truly didn't understand it okay they don't know so if you're taking away the parents rights these teachers why give them so much power to take their parents rights away of a five-year-old a six-year-old seven-year-old yes casey mentioned that changing that one part i don't see casey or anybody else saying here i want to abolish it completely he's saying just the elementary children Okay, from my experience as a transgender person, I may be wrong, but I don't think any of you are. You don't understand my community. You don't understand these children um, in elementary school. Okay, they, you're, you're putting everybody in the same boat, all these children, okay? What a five-year-old can do versus an 18-year-old is totally different life experiences. Um, their maturity, okay? So it's impossible or ridiculous to dump them all into one category, okay? Yes, I don't think anybody up here wants to abolish it. I just think it needs to be tweaked, okay? You need to consider these young children who, just the other day, there was a child in school who wants to be a cat. So he sits there and she sits there and licks her boards, meows all day. They allow it, okay? And are they telling the parents? Who knows? But the parents need to know. The parents need to guide the children, get them the special help they need. Okay? It's not an easy transition. It took me six, 59 years to come to this conclusion. You know, considered a tomboy all my life. So it took me 59 years. A five year old, once you start taking away, um, telling them they can do this or that and they can't turn it around. I counsel a lot of children or young adults that became a woman and then now want to change back to a man. They don't want to be stuck as male or female. It's now the, they, them, and they non-binary. They, they don't want. They're not sure, so they don't know what they want. And you're sitting here trying to make decisions for them, which I don't think it's right. I'm here if anybody wants to talk to a real life transgender person. When I came out to Casey last year, he came up to me and he said, could you sit with me and Doug and go over this? Okay, did any of you sit down with a real transgender person and ask their opinion? At least he did, at least Doug did. I've known Casey for 10 years. He knew me as a lesbian and he's a good friend to me as a transgender person. Good evening, my name is Claire, the King of Fort Lee, shortly. 
Thank you, Amy. And please, everybody, please continue to do your due diligence. Actually read the policy, find facts, ask better questions, see the bigger picture. Don't allow false misleading information to deteriorate the integrity of our community. Be one voice. Whether we like it or not, times have changed. The current world our children are growing up in is not the same when we did. Navigating life has become more complicated. Family structures are complex. Information is too readily available. It can be confusing. There's so much pressure, even for adults today. So why do we take support and help away from our young ones? This is not solely a parents or students right issue. This is a mental wellness issue. And just to be clear, I mean the mental state of how one is able to cope with the stresses of life. Do they feel happy, loved? Do they feel safe? After all, these are basic human needs we all need to require to thrive and survive no matter how old we are. Parents, myself included, know that we are not bad parents. We simply only know what we know, which to be honest, is not everything. Would I like to think I know what's best for my child? Absolutely. But the reality is our children will grow into their own person and there will be a day when only they would know what is best for themselves. So let our community be a place where they can belong, feel safe, supported, valued, even when they feel different. Where our children can also form meaningful relationships outside of their homes with peers, teachers, neighbors, other adults that they can trust. What if 20 years down the road, God willing, we're all still here at the Board of Ed meeting on a Wednesday evening. The stories that we're sharing are about that one teacher that one trusted adult that helped the student find themselves. Give them the confidence to have a meaningful conversation with their parents so they can be the person they want to be today. These students are asking for support. They're asking for help. They need a safety net. Why will we take that away from them? Give our already amazing, passionate educators who are obviously already trained more resources. Get them all the support they need so they can continue to help grow our children into thriving adults. I like to believe we all come from a place of love. We voted to put our trust in all of you. Tonight, your decision will be setting a precedent for the future. If you can take this away, what are you going to take away next? Leave policy 5756 as it is. Protect all of our children and to all the students listening tonight. If this repeals happens, even if these board members fail you, please know there is an entire community of adults who will stand by you and support you in any way you can. Hi there, my name is Hannah Simpson, 21 Convent Avenue, Apartment 3, New York, New York. I am, though, a proud uh, alumna of the New Jersey and Bergen County education system by way of Hillsdale, New Jersey. And I spent many, many years coming to Fort Lee, New Jersey, where my grandparents lived until they unfortunately passed. I kept the Plaza Diner in business. <laughs> um, so I want to share some of my own experience as a transgender woman and uh, ask the board to give you a little lesson right now. So I'd like to ask each of you to pick up a pen or just mime it if you don't have one. And just mind writing your name for me for a second. Okay, great. Now do that with the hand you don't normally use. How's that feel? Okay, how long did it take you to realize that? That's kind of how I explain gender identity to people who don't have that particular experience. It's a lot like your handedness, something you figure out and nobody can really tell you what it's supposed to be. There are unfortunately parents in every school system across this country who have this mythology that uh, a child's gender identity is something within their prerogative, like weekly piano lessons, let alone ability to control. Um, that's not the case. Um, I did not come out until later in life. There was no structure whatsoever for me in New Jersey to feel protected, safe, or equipped to come out. But what I found out later in life is that there were three transgender people in my grade alone. And uh, I don't know what my father personally would have said if I had come out to him and my mother at an earlier age, although he is here in the audience with me right now and loves to be here when I come to public speaking and supports me, but I am the only one of those three who is still welcome in my parents' living room. Um, and that's after they came out as adults. Imagine how they would have been received as children. 
And that's the reality is there are some people who do not want to believe that their children might be exposed to transgender children in their classrooms. Those are the ones that a school system has every right to be concerned if that child happens to be LGBTQ, et cetera, of coming to that parent with that information. Again, the whole point is not to withhold anything from parents, but to make sure that the tools are in place to make sure that that child comes to their parents from a place of strength. I'm going to tell you how this plays out. Again, I have mentored dozens of New Jersey adolescents and young adults from my own school system who've come up through the years from teachers who invited me into their classrooms, from camps that I've been a counselor at, and through Garden State of Quality. So a fifth grader, Rosie, came out and transitioned and started living as her authentic self at the time, she, her pronouns, um, as a female in her fifth grade New Jersey public school middle school. And uh, another student confronted her and she honestly thought she was going to get beaten up. And the student had a simple question for you, for her. How come you get to transition? And it turned out that this was a student who was trans themselves and didn't have any resources and didn't have a family that was going to be supportive. My simple point is if you kneecap the school system and the teachers that can provide this support, how do you possibly think the students are going to have the emotional tools, resilience, or capacity to help their fellow students when that's where they go next? Good evening, members of the board. My name is Jamie Zook. I'm an attorney. I'm also a transgender man. My pronouns are he, him. I'm from Wardentown, New Jersey. Um, I'm not here to speak on behalf of the transgender community. I'm here to speak on behalf of myself as an individual transgender person. I do not know how many transgender people there are in this room, and neither does anyone else who is here in this room. Uh, I understand that on the agenda is the repeal of policy 5756. And, and I, I, I really appreciate many of the comments that have been made here tonight um, about that and then how it, it's a bit of a red herring because at the end of the day, the school district is required to abide by the law against discrimination. Policy 5756 is an enormously helpful policy because it assists school districts in abiding by the law against discrimination, which isn't different for young students than it is for, for, for older students. Um, so it is an enormously helpful policy, but if that policy is repealed, if that policy is amended, the school district will be bound to the same exact standards as every other school district. It just won't have a policy to refer to, or will have a different policy to refer to, which could lead to some, to some confusion. Um, I, I think that everyone in this room is interested in supporting um, young people. I really believe that in supporting young people's safety and well-being and mental health. And if there are questions about policy 5756 and um, records requirements, there is a robust community of folks in New Jersey who have experience uh, with policy 5756 and how it plays out with different specific systems. And IT systems and, and, and also in specific scenarios. So I encourage the members of the board to make use of the resources that you have available to you in New Jersey. Um, if you have questions, there are answers. There are other boards that have dealt with the same things and have found ways to support all students in the district through the existing 5756. So I ask you to take advantage of the resources that are available to you um, throughout the state as you work through the, the questions, uh, the questions that you may have. Thank you. Hello, my name is Daniel. I live at a 2100 Lumina. Uh, I just want to say that I'm vehemently opposed to the idea that the root of the conversation is uh, parental rights. It's not. Um, it's just a symptom of a larger wave of anti-intellectualism uh, that is sweeping across America uh, that requires an outright rejection of experience and qualifications. 
Uh, instead of entrusting educators and experts who spent years in school, who have had many years of experience in observing and evaluating the emotional needs of children, you're rather choosing to insist that professionals are not qualified to use their discretion to ensure student safety. Any discussion of queer indoctrination of children is inflammatory, unfounded, and is in direct opposition to a, a stigma-free for me. And I want, why don't I say something next in, in response to your heartfelt uh, message. Uh, this is uh, Iris King. Um, I understand that you uh, had many conversations with your voters. Your job as a, on the Board of Education is to follow a set agenda put forth by a select few of your voters. It's to do what is right by the time before they think it. Hi, my name is Christos Batianis. I live at Town Hunter Road, Fort Lee, New Jersey. I am going to be real quick. Um, I heard people say that there are experts in the school, that the students feel safe speaking with the teachers, there are trained professionals, there are sociologists, psychologists, all of it, right? Well, this school failed my kids. My children in your school were diagnosed with have IP, IPs, both my kids. The school hired a psychiatrist to interview my daughter, who came up with the conclusion that she was cognitively dis disadvantaged, she was cognitively impaired. So as parents, we advocated for her. We took her to see other specialists, and what she has is sight disability and dyslexia. Your specialist said she was cognitively impaired. She's now in college, pre-law, and a 4.0 student because she has dyslexia, because she sees the world a little differently. But your experts, like everyone saying, these experts that know their children or, or the children should confide in over their parents when they're little. This happened when they were at school for Lewis F. School, uh, the middle school, and then in high school is when we stepped in and advocated for them. My, my wife advocated also for my son, who the school now sent him to a different school because you did not have the capacity to help him. So how do you, where, where do you find the capacity to help children now? The, the parents are the ones that will advocate for their kids, not the school. So repeal 5756. Good evening, everyone. I'm Alex Wolf. I live on 2nd Street. Uh, I want to begin by responding to a couple of things that Paula said. Um, Paula, you began by sort of listing the bona fides of you and, and your fellow board members. Uh, I've only lived in Fort Lee for about eight years, so I can't speak to your entire history, but you, like all of us, are defined by our actions, and repealing 5756 is an anti-LGBTQ action. If you want to be considered someone who is a supporter of the LGBTQ community, then you should not rescind this policy. You also suggested that I, I almost couldn't believe my ears. You suggested that the town has a black eye. And you're right, the town does have a black eye. But it is not from the parents who are defending this vital, critical policy on social media. The town has a black eye because five of our board members voted to rescind this policy. That's why we have a black eye. And the last thing I want to say is that I'm, I'm really having a hard time reconciling what we've heard today with what we heard last week, because last week, apparently, the issue was so critical that the policy had to be rescinded immediately. But apparently, there was a lot of discussion about parents' rights last week, and the policy had to be rescinded to honor parents' rights. And it wasn't just coming from the people behind me. There were people on the board who rescinded, who said that they were going to rescind this policy in the name of parents' rights. And today we have heard nothing about that from people on the board. So which is it, right? I'm confused. Is it parents' rights or is it not? And let me just be clear. Last week, these students spoke very forcefully about what parents' rights means in the context of this policy. But let me just repeat it because I'm not sure everyone's hearing it. In the context of this policy, Repealing it in the name of parents' rights means that you think parents should have the right to abuse their children. You think parents should have the right to emotionally, 
physically abuse their children. They should have the right to make them homeless. They should have the right to harm them. They should even have the right to kill them because that is what has happened in the situations where trans students, trans children have been outed against their will to their parents. Now, maybe none of us in this room would do that. I believe that. But it is naive to think that there are not parents in this world who would harm their children because they came out as trans or gay. And yes, perhaps even in Fort Lee. So make up your mind. Is it parents' rights or is it not? And if it is, if you rescind this policy in the name of parents' rights, you should own up to what you're rescinding it for. In other words, do not rescind this policy. Thank you. Fort Lee, New Jersey. I'd like to speak about Rule 5756. There's a lot of, you know, flinging going on. We have a lot of activists, uh, people sitting on our PTAs. They've taken over three or four of the PTAs in our school district with a radical ideology that very small children know exactly what they are and can go to a teacher privately and have a discussion about sex only sex this is literally about sexuality with a teacher when one in ten children are molested or abused by a public school teacher for the department of education but hey i'd like to speak about rule of law 576 which severely impacts parental rights and the well-being of our children our fundamental right to the care custody and control of our children is not only a principle deeply rooted in our society but also a liberty interest recognized by the supreme court of the united states under the due process clause of the 14th amendment in essence as it is currently written and from what i heard from other parents supporting the rule it clearly by violates the parents' right to due process. I heard a child speak last week on Zoom who said they didn't like their name and had gone to their teacher to create a new file with a new name, withholding information as trivial as this from parents assumes that all parents always pose a risk to their child. This application of a blanket approach tre treating all parents or guardians as potentially harmful without individual evidence of harm is a constitutional violation. This approach not only undermines the trust between parents and the educational system, but violates a parent's due process right under the Constitution. My greatest concern, and as I've already pointed out, lies in the lack of transparency in the assumption that all parents or guardians pose a risk to their child's well-being in matters of personal identity. While protecting children from harm is obvious, Obviously necessary, the strict scrutiny standard required by constitutional jurisprudence stands. This standard demands that any infringement on the constitutional right must serve a compelling state interest and be narrowly tailored to achieve that interest using the least restrictive means possible. Lumping all parents into one pot as harmful is on its face unconstitutional. It violates their right to due process. It comes between a parent and child bond. We are not advocating against protecting vulnerable children. If a child is vulnerable, you have means to deal with this in school. We are calling for a policy that respects the constitutional rights of parents and is based on the evidence of actual risk or harm, not assumption that all parents are unsafe. And the FB post that was posted to the trans um, LGBT club is in violation as it warns children in our district that they were not safe with their own parents. cleanser portion of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Esther, Esther, Esther Hunt Silver, 2426 Fifth Street, Fort Lake. Um, a couple of things. I have, I have a list. I, I can't do it on the phone. So we heard a lot about the intention was not to repeal it. You wanted to make corrections. But it kind of sounded like if you just, you know, if you buy a house and you want to make renovations, you don't tear it down. So that part didn't make sense. You know, and then there was a comment that you didn't intend to affect the students at the high school. If you repeal the policy, 
you're affecting all the students. So that, that just, it doesn't jive, it really doesn't. Now the other thing, now you're proposing a new policy. All right, cool, we'll look at it. Policy 3319, I don't know if you guys realized it, the policies are numbered in sections. You can't just <laughs> randomly pick a number, all right? The 3000 section, is regarding staff members. So if you if you adopt 3319, you know what follows right after? 3321, which is about acceptable use of computer work by staff, computer, <laughs> computer networks by staff. It, I'm just saying, everything's being rushed. It does not make sense. You're not doing it in a, the right way. Then the other question I had, how was policy 3319 drafted? Did the did this group, the, the five, did you guys meet? Did you email? How was this drafted? All right, uh, that is a question that I think the lawyer should demand of this group. All right, how was it drafted? How was it communicated? Unless it was just one or two people that drafted it and just sent it out to everybody else. Now, the other thing, last week, all right, three CUR. I, you know what? I, I just really don't understand what happened with that vote, all right? There was no discussion, there was no questions or anything asked of during that meeting, and it was just voted down. So immediately, I went and looked it up. 3CUR, it was a resolution to provide professional development, all right, for 300 bucks, all right? That's more than tonight is costing, so <laughs> cost was not the problem. So then I looked at the proposal, all right? You know, what kind of scandalous professional development was Dr. <laughs> Kravitz proposing, all right? This is what it says. This professional development workshop is designed to equip educators with the knowledge, skills, and strategies to effectively engage with students from diverse cultural backgrounds. Read the proposal, all right? It was great, and I honestly couldn't find anything objectionable. So, it made me wonder, how many of you guys, over the last few years, have attended Lunar New Year celebrations, the Greek Independence Day luncheon, all right? St. Rocco's Festival, you are all celebrating the cultural diversity of our town. So why would you not encourage our teachers to utilize it and use that as a strength? So then, so then I was like, okay, maybe it's the presenter, all right? I mean, on paper, he looks good, I'm sorry. 25 years in education, two master's degrees. He's got all these credentials. Didn't make sense. So then I looked him up on LinkedIn. Guess what I found? He had a rainbow banner behind his profile. And I certainly hope that was not the reason. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, um, I am a student at Fort Lee High School. My name is Jack Robinson and I live on 2000 Gulf Lee so um, I'm very happy that um, what is it? Um, this was touched upon uh, last meeting and also uh, briefly touched upon today. Um, it's the belief that, or the argument that was um, that parents are their children's biggest advocates, and uh, so therefore they deserve to know the details of their child's gender identity. And while we should have under we all understand that parents should be their children's biggest advocates, statistics prove that transgender children are more than four times likely to be victims of bullying. And according to the National Health Institute of Health, at least 39% of transgender adolescents reported to be physically abused at home. I personally have a friend who was kicked out of their house because their parents came across their social media account in which they were openly transgender. And I have another friend who, if their parents found out that they were transgender, would likely face the same consequences. And so, uh, although parents should be their children's biggest advocates, putting them at risk of physical, not just mental, but physical abuse is an obvious threat to the health of students affected by the repealing of Policy 5756. Uh, one of my teachers was discussing Policy 5756 with another staff member during class just last week and said, in reference to the possibility in which they discovered one of their students is gender identity, and I quote, if I find out, I'm going to tell everyone. The lack of sensitivity, sensitivity that this discussion has continued to be treated with when students' lives are at stake is appalling, and I'm pleading that the committee makes the right decision. Thank you, and I yield my hat. Hello, my name is Romina Colombo, and I live at 1530 Palisade Avenue, and I go to Portland High School. I'm a junior, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the school paper. Um, I just have a couple things to say. Removing this 
policy 5756 remove a vital safe space for queer students, for gender queer students. And also I'd like to refer to a point. Um, this is not about sex. This is not about sexuality. This is about being So I don't really see how that ties into molestation. Excuse me. Um, Just direct your comments to us, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Um, furthermore, I would like to say that many parents are abusive, okay? Especially when dealing with trans children. I'm not saying that all of them are. I'm just saying that people, a lot of them, are transphobic. And by their children sharing their like their gender expression and their identities with their parents, that like the fact that they are putting themselves in danger if that does happen, that is horrible. And that should not happen. And also, parents should be having that place, that safe space. They should be providing a safe space for their children in the first place, where the children want to talk to their parents about these issues. Because so many children want to share themselves and their ideas and their expression of themselves, their identities as a whole, as a person, they want to share it with their parents. And that's just a natural instinct, instinct I guess. So I would just like to remind that if children do not share their ideas and their identity with their parents, it is for a reason. Uh, thank you. My name is Kevin Oliver, uh, 441 Washington Avenue, Delhi, New Jersey. Uh, I am a Fort Lee High School teacher for the past 23 years. I'm also the uh, Vice President of Fort Lee Education Association. Um, I didn't plan to speak tonight, but as I listened to some things, um, I had to write down some notes, and now I think I have to speak. Um, let me be clear about something. Teachers are not converting their students. They're not convincing them that they're a different gender, that they're a different sexual orientation. It's ridiculous to suggest that. They're certainly not encouraging them to be cats. <laughs> These are myths, okay? The statistic that 10% of public school teachers are molesting their students is a bold-faced lie. It's simply not true. It's propaganda. We know it, and we have to call it out. This is dangerous, okay? It's dangerous to our kids, it's dangerous to our teachers, and it really needs to stop, okay? What I really wanted to say uh, was I wanted to voice my support for our students. Um, it takes a lot of guts for a lot of these kids to get up here, um, whether they're members of the LGBTQ plus community or their allies to get up here in front of a room, to stand up for themselves, to stand up for their friends. So um, I know I can only speak for myself officially, uh, but I know that I speak for a lot of other teachers and a lot of other school employees because I've talked to them a lot over the past week and a half. Um, and I have to say that we are very proud of you. Very what? Proud of you. I commend you for having the courage to stand up and to speak up and to share your experiences, your feelings, and your fears, even in the face of some who would suggest that your letters or your words are fake or coerced. These people do not represent the majority. You do not answer to them. You do not have to justify yourselves to them. Please know that when you speak, your words are powerful. No one can erase your lived experience, and no one can invalidate your feelings. I know that most of you are probably used to adults being the authority figures and having to be subordinate to them. Um, but one of the harsh lessons of growing up that you are learning as we speak is that sometimes adults are the ones that need to be educated. <laughs> and sometimes the students have to become the teachers, unfortunately. This is one of those times. I know many of you have put yourselves out there over the last week or so to do just that. Your efforts to teach others about compassion and empathy and what it's really like to walk in your shoes are admirable. Keep doing that regardless of the outcome of what this evening is. Um, there are so many of us that hear you and see you and support you. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Carrie Ann Masters, and I live at 1018 Jasmine Way in Fort Lee. You'll forgive me if I don't know when my time is nearly up because I can't really see the timer since I rescheduled necessary eye surgery to be here today. Okay. That is how strongly I feel about what is happening in this district. I grew up in Fort Lee. I attended schools here from kindergarten to 12th grade, and my children attended schools here since kindergarten and are now in eighth grade and 10th grade. Given my long history in this community, I was very surprised to see the Board of Education vote to remove key protections from some of the district's most vulnerable students at the March 4th Board of Education meeting by voting to rescind policy 5756. My husband and I actively chose to raise our children here and send them to Fort Lee schools for many reasons. But one of those reasons is certainly because Fort Lee is the kind of place where students of all kinds can feel safe and included. I'm extremely disappointed to see the Board of Education take actions to remove the protections that help create that environment. <coughs> this is especially the case when it's being done in so hasty a manner, and discussions have now been shunted to a special meeting on short notice. I also find today's discussions of a proposed new policy surprising. Firstly, because at the meeting on March 4th, the motion that was made, seconded, and voted on was only to rescind the policy and not to the same policy and replace it with a new one. Now the direction seems to have hastily changed to putting together a new policy. This was clearly, has not, clearly not gone through normal processes of review by the board and its committees or public comment. Just because some board members dislike the decision of a policy committee doesn't mean it isn't valid or it doesn't need to be followed. I'm concerned about the implications for the district when something that deals with the civil rights of students is done without ample opportunity for committee, community members to understand the process and decision making involved. Secondly, because we know that in other cases where New Jersey boards of education have replaced the current policy with new policies of their own devise, <coughs> they have been subject to litigation by the state because of these policies. They did not pass most of New Jersey law of discrimination and we're opening ourselves up to the same situation. As a parent of children who attend school in this district, I would strongly prefer that the district spend its money to improve facilities and fund educational <laughs> programs rather than spending funds to defend a lawsuit from the state, especially when the reason for taking the action that has been adopted by many, many other school districts and that has been functioning, I'm sorry, the reason for taking the action is to remove a policy that's adopted by many other school districts and has been functioning in Fort Lee without difficulty for a number of years. But to be the most concerning thing about this is the lack of consideration being given to students who could find themselves in danger without the protections of policy 5756. Thank you. Hello, my, my name is Aiden Park. I live at Cedar Court on John Street. I'll begin with a small testimony. Last year, I was confronted by one of my so-called friends and repeatedly called the F-slur and the R-slur, who also called my parents, for the sake of political correctness, F-slur-loving parents. I reached out to the school about this, and they helped me. If 5756 is repealed, the protection I received from the school staff and police that helped me is at, is at risk. <laughs> to the Fort Lee Board of Education, you speak so much of community. I know a lot about community. I am an avid member of the International Thespian Society, Troop 3103, and the Associate Conducting Drum Major for our Fort Lee High School's marching band. I know very much about community. I'm a leader there. At least, I try to be. And I sit in this room full of people who are supporting keeping policy 5756 intact. This is your community. I urge you to listen to them. And it is an embarrassment to some of us that there are students at Fort Lee High School, underage people, who have spoken at a higher caliber and maturity than some of the adults in this room. Now, 
I am queer. I will leave it at that. And I will go home tonight knowing that I have outed that part of myself and feel a little more in danger. I came to that conclusion after several long years of dysphoria, confusion, and self-searching. This LGBTQ plus identity that many come to terms with is not a matter of mental illness. This is a matter of how an individual feels about themselves. No one has any say in your identity. And you don't have a say on how I feel, that's on me. But what you do have a say in is how you can protect me on how you can help me. And the other LGBTQ students of Fort Lee by keeping policy 5756 intact and letting it stand. I will speak on behalf of many others. We are afraid, we are angry, we are hurt, we are upset, and we are again scared that our safety will be put in jeopardy because of this policy's potential rescindance. Please, I am begging you, do not take this away. I don't want to live in a town where I am at risk of being jumped by students at my own school for who I am. Thank you. Um, so, you know, it seems that there's concerns by the elementary school parents. I assume what their concern is that they wouldn't be made aware of their children's exploration of transgender or non-binary status. Um, you know, I'd just like you to think about the things you explored as a child and young adult that you didn't tell your parents about. You know, I don't think that your parents need to know everything. I don't feel like I need to know everything about my kids. If you're exploring, explore. And then when you come to a thought, or if you want to talk to me, fine, talk to me. I have two children in Fort Lee High School. And I feel that, in my experience, it's more important that your children are heard and supported by individuals who they trust to tell, even if it's not me. Again, I'd hope, like the other parent, that it would be me. but. It's not. In fact, I had an experience with Mr. Oliver here, where my son felt more comfortable talking to him than to me, and he did. And I'm fine, you know, and also with his uh, guidance counselor in Fort Lee High School, and, you know, it, it turned out well for him. So, to, you know, to, to suppose the other side to people who talk about their terrible experiences, my son has had good experiences with counselors from school one through the high school. He, he still does. Um, I also wanted to put, you know, the perspective of this concern uh, the, into, I'm sorry, the idea of this concern into a perspective for that. You know, based on data from large epidemiological studies reported in 2022, 1.82% of youth aged 13 to 17 in the Northeast identify as transgender, which is slightly higher than in other U.S. regions. In New Jersey, it reported that there are 3,800 total youth aged 13 to 17, or 0.67% of kids reported to be transgender. So basically what I'm saying is their concern is not likely to impact them. It's not, it, it's not. What should be more concerning to the parents of young and high school students is the impact of the retraction of this on their current uh, I'm sorry, what should be more concerning is the impact of this retraction on the current transgender students in our community. Removal of protections for anyone would instill feelings of anxiety, depression, and potentially suicidal ideation due to concerns about safety and the knowledge that their safety is not deemed worthy of protection. Transgender individuals are at increased risk for suicide relative to non-transgender people, and researchers using primarily convenient samples have discovered that 18 to 45 percent of transgender adults and youth have attempted suicide in their lifetime. This is, excuse me, drastically higher than the general population rate of 4.6 percent. As reported in the Journal of Violence and Gender, experiences of discrimination, similar to what you're considering allowing, are associated with higher levels of suicidal ideation and attempts. 
harassment and bullying are also associated with suicidal attempts. Gender identity acceptance is protected against suicidal ideation. And in addition, recent small studies of transgender youth who are allowed to use their preferred names and pronouns, I'm sorry, uh, basically it's protected. Um, I also just was going to mention briefly suicide rates. And you know, I'm speaking as the parent of a child who suffers from anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation. And if you can protect one of these transgender students by protecting their rights, you're saving all. Thank you. If you ran out of time, I can always email yeah. us. Hello, my name is Demetria, and I'm a resident of Portly on Tom Hunter Road. I, had, I came with a speech, but I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to say my speech anymore. I just want to say that from my personal experience at this school, you guys have done nothing to help me at all. I had to leave the school. I suffered greatly at that school. I had to drop out, get my GED, and then complete my studies elsewhere because you cannot accommodate me and my needs. I also had a best friend at this school who's being abused by her mother, who has came clean to teachers, and you guys did nothing to help her. You guys do not care about helping the students and about making them feel safe. You want to push your laws, push your agendas, kick the parents out, make the kids trust the state, put their trust in the state, but you do not actually care about helping the children and helping the people. You don't. And that is the truth. I witnessed it firsthand. My, one of my closest friends at the time went through it firsthand, and you guys did nothing to help her. And if your committee cannot, and on top of that, when I was at the school, you guys banned children from wearing do rags, a protective hairstyle, for whatever reason, I don't know. You guys do not care about inclusivity, about helping children. You just care about pushing your agendas on people. Goodbye. Hello, um, my name is Anastasia Lieberman. I live on 15th Street. And there are plenty of people that I know at home who were not able to come to this meeting because they do not feel safe coming to this meeting. Um, I have plenty of friends who would love to support the cause, who do not want this policy to be repealed, who want to protect trans children, but they do not feel that their parents would have allowed them to come here. They did not feel safe coming to this meeting because there are still people out there who do not, who pose as a threat to trans students. Um, I don't know if I feel comfortable coming up here, but I have because this is an important issue to me. Um, there are things that I don't tell my parents as a teenager. Does that mean that I don't trust my parents? No. I, I trust my parents, but as I'm going through this part of my life, you know, it's important to explore and to sometimes figure things out on your own because in life you're going to have to figure things out on your own. And it's wonderful that there are trusting parents out there who can offer support, but that is not always the case. For example, growing up, I had a childhood best friend. He was trans. And when his parents found out about his identity, they sent him to a conversion therapy, and I've not seen him in years. This is not a made up fact. I have not made this up for sympathy. This is a true fact that I have suffered greatly from, and my friend has suffered even more. I'm up here speaking for him, for kids like him, who could not come to this meeting, who did not feel safe, because there are people who do not want to protect his rights or kids like his. People say that students are too young to know their gender identity. Maybe some are. Maybe some don't figure, out, figure it out until they're older or later in their life. But I know kids who do know that in some way they are different. And school should be a comfortable place for those children to explore that. Because we want to create a safe space for our children. And creating a hostile environment through these meetings is not creating that safe space. Yeah. The world
world is changing, right? We all know that. There's going to be new ideas. There's going to be new things pushed that aren't always comfortable. And it's important to meet those things head on, especially if it is something that people identify as, especially if it is a civil right, a human right, that a person should feel comfortable going to school and being themselves. I wrote a letter. People here wrote letters, and people here called those letters fake. Our letters were not fake. Our voices are our own. And there are not people telling me what to say. I am here speaking for myself and for everyone else who could not speak up. Thank you. on topic today because it's so much to unpack so I just wanted to be with me. Angelic Women. I live on 15th Street. I've been in Fort Lee for about 10 years now. Two kids in the system. Um, I did have a conversation with my son before I got here who does not identify with the community but I did ask him because he did have some friends that do identify with the community and he did feel that they should have a safe space within their teachers and their faculty within the school because he did identify teachers that he felt so safe with. But as a parent and as a mother who's active, I think that we're just kind of missing some part of unpacking this is that if my child is failing, if my child has to go through an IEP, I'm pulled into the conversation because there is a group of people that have identified that we are all in this together to help this child to go through this process. So I, if we're touching on the fact that whether or not a parent should be privy to something a child is mentally going through, or not mentally, something a child is going through with the next identity, to remove the parent from the conversation, to me, seems really asinine. I think it's important that we continue and maintain the line of communication with the parents, and unfortunately, some parents are not safe, and that is true, and that is factual, so I do think that it's the discernment of the professional that the child came to, to make that assessment of whether or not how you're gonna facilitate that line of communication with that parent, or even if you are, but to just outright say that you're not, I think it's a disservice to parents that are active, that have a line of communication with their kids, to remove them from the conversation. More importantly, um, I'm losing my thoughts here. Um, I'm losing my thoughts here. Um, I just think that just try to keep the line of communication open. If there's something going on with our children, as a parent, we deserve to know. If there's something that's happening, because if I if I move from this community and I remove my kids from this school system, who is the safe person that they're going to be able to go to if I remove that person from their life and I'm not privy to what they're going through on the inside? So just consider some of these things when we're talking about this conversation. Consider the fact that there are places that are not safe for children. Consider the fact that there are places that kids can go to within their home setting but also consider the fact that we're all in this together and that it's important to not break that line of communication from a parent's perspective. Thank you for your time. I am Ann Lee from Edgewater, <coughs> 202 to from me and I am queer, and I grew up a long time ago, but all I knew was boy meets girl. They marry, girl has babies. I didn't know there was any other way to live. Had I known, my life would be very different. Or, and the other thing is nobody is trying to take parents out of the equation. Parents, if they, if the children feel comfortable with them, they can be as involved as they want, as they need to be. But if they're not comfortable, they're not ready to come out to the parent, all we want is for the kids to have a safe space at school and be able to talk to adults that they feel they can be involved. Hi, I'm Kelly 
Lincoln, uh, from 332 Lincoln Avenue. Um, oh, yeah. first of all, I want to ask how many people are online. Do we know? How many people do we have online? Okay. Like <laughs> um, so I'm here today asking the board to keep policy 5756, which has been in place for the past nine years, five years in its current state, all of which I believe Ms. Kobat and Mr. Rubino have been on the board um, for those years and have no problem with it, right? So I ask that we please focus on issues such as teacher shortage is greatly affecting our student body instead of spending more time and money on healing an existing policy to remove the protection for the students who may need it. So speaking of supporting the LGBTQ community, after last year's Fort Lee Pride event, Ms. Colbert has made this public comment to Mrs. Zach from the Prison Club. This is her comment. Thank you for all of your hard work in organizing this event. Your BOE greatly appreciates it. Our district's public relations Efforts are going to be more formalized starting in July with a more formal PR initiative. So this event will, will be get wider publicity next year. Great job. This is Ms. Colbeck's comment. So I'm curious to know what formal PR initiative the board has done for the past eight months, because this comment was posted last year, to promote this event. Or was it just a personal publicity, publicity stunt to show support, to show support? I hope that the BOA is not making promises that you have no intention of keeping because it sounds like that comment was posted on behalf of the board. But it sounds like Ms. Colbeck is in support of the LGBTQ community, the action to repeal 5756 serves the total opposite. In the actual words of our students, it was a betrayal to the LGBTQ youth. So again, instead of us wasting more time and money on repealing 57, 56, 50, geez, I can't even speak now, 5756, Let's spend the energy on improving our schools, work together to hire more teachers, and retain teachers, please. Not forcing them to out the children, and maybe spend a little bit more extra time and money to promote Fort Lee Pride event, so we can continue to embrace inclusion and diversity in this community. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Ruggiero, I think. Oh, no, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, sir. Sorry. Jump forward. Good to see you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Crickshin. I have two kids in the district. I live on 2nd Street. And I love Fort Lee. I love my transgender family member. I'm going to do a little shout out. And I love my LGBTQ neighbors. Um, I would like to say keep 5756 in place. I think the New Jersey Attorney General said it best. He said, repealing 5756 will eliminate critical protections for our transgender students, critical protections for their safety. I'd like to respectfully disagree with Ms. Colbath tonight, who said that Fort Lee got a black eye because parents stood up in support of the LGBTQ community. I'd like to offer a different perspective. I think Fort Lee got a black eye because five board members moved to repeal 5756 without a plan in place. They rushed to develop a new policy that was leaked to the community in a few days, was developed in a few days. They rushed to have a special session, which I just learned cost over $1,000. And they wrote a policy themselves without from my understanding, these five members don't have any expertise in K through 12 education or mental health or gender or LGBTQ. In contrast, 57 and 56, when it was developed by the state, when Chris Christie in 2017 wrote into law that it should be developed, it took two years to get to the district. And that's because they took a thoughtful process because it was about the safety of kids. And they consulted a panel of experts to develop this. Importantly, the five Board of Education members have said they've done this for parent rights. And for those of you who aren't familiar, who may be watching, the parents' rights movement was launched by Moms for Liberty and the New Jersey Project. Um, and across the country and state, they have been repealing health curricula to so sex ed. They've been rolling back protections for LGBTQ students, including policy 5657. They've been taking down LGBTQ welcome flags. They've been ending 
diversity, equity, and inclusion programs, and they've been banning books about Martin Luther King Jr. and Ruby Bridges and incredible civil rights champions. And if you're watching this thinking that could never happen in Fort Lee, it can and it has. And a few people have already raised curriculum three last week at the Board of Education meeting that was voted down by the same five Board of Education members. We're an instructor that had an LGBTQ flag on his LinkedIn page, and it was focused on diversity and inclusion. It was voted down by these same five board members. In August of last year, Curriculum 5, in an August Board of Education meeting, a curriculum vendor was voted down after a parent said their agency once worked on LGBTQ issues, and those, some of those same board members voted that down. It's a pattern. So if there's any black guy, that's the pattern. I was going to end on a quote by Martin Luther King Jr., but those books are being banned by the parents' rights advocates. So instead of just say actions are more important than words, and watch the actions of these five board of education members. Catherine Conrad, 1565 Anderson Avenue. To our queer students, they came for you. Yes, they did, but we are here to come through for you, with you. We circled the wagons, pens ready, made those calls, wrote those letters. We pressed, we will continue to press. They came for you, but we are here to come through to make sure that you are included in the definition of all, because we are fired up. They speak as if they, if you don't exist, as if you cannot feel, as if you cannot see, that their backtrack, their takebacks are empty. They came for you. They came for you, and we are here to come through to ensure that your light continues to shine. And to our rebel teachers, continue to fight, continue to teach, continue to create these safe spaces filled with empathy and dignity and love. Oh, you rebel teachers, the front line to the world will become. Continue to hand out your smiles and your high fives and your gentle reminders of compassion. Continue to stroke the fires of curiosity. Continue to encourage critical thinking. Continue, continue to cultivate autonomy. You see, the rainbow is too bright for some. It's still, it's blinding to their ill will towards our students, towards our teachers, towards our tomorrow. To you rebel teachers, continue to champion these students, especially the ones who feel that the walls of their sanctuary are a little more scary, a little less trustful. Oh, you rebel teachers, we need you more now than ever. Continue to fight for these students, even when this group of adults bound to serve all of you to cultivate and sustain it, but choose not to. You chose not to. You chose not to. You chose not to. You chose not to support them. We all sit here and talk about the lessons that we learn when we are children. The very first lesson we learn is your actions speak louder than your words. So when you do something against a group that you say is an ally, and all of a sudden, we got to clap back. Welcome to our group of people that are sitting behind us that are going to support these kids no matter what you choose to do. And when you sit here and you say that you're going one way, then you do the other, we know. We know. Hello. Um, my name is Marco Uribe, and I live at 1018 Jessamine Way. I would just like to say that I am in favor of this policy because I, as a student myself in this school district, believe that no kid should be outed without their consent. And of course, I, I believe this with a major caveat, that no kid should be outed with their consent unless there is a major threat to their health or their safety. Of course, I'm saying both of these things because I want children to be safe, including me and including my peers. And of course, there are policies in place to make sure that children who are actually in danger, who come out and 
and actually happen to be in danger and this needs to be reported to their parents that it is but of course a, like without these situations ignoring these no kid should be outed without their consent it's frankly just it's just taking away their right to privacy and really it's their own identity because whenever a child comes to a teacher and says i'm questioning my gender identity that's taken as oh i'm coming out as transgender that might not be true but it's going to be taken as that and it's going to be told to those parents if this if this rule is not in place it's all up to the teachers whether they tell their parents or not whether they are going to keep this person's information safe or if they are forced to tell them because they think it's a it's a safety concern it could very well not be a safety concern but they are still allowed and are fully able to get away with telling their parents when really the bigger safety concern would be telling the parents would be letting them know because now no longer is their home a safe environment and now their safe environment in school is no longer one because it's really led to them being outed and just it's not fair for them to like to just not be able to have their own voice heard when they say something about their identity and it's just told willy-nilly by someone else it's it's not right children have the right to come out when they think they are comfortable with doing so and and if they say their identity is really contributing if they say that they're in an unsafe situation because of their identity then that's when we can notify parents that's what that's when they are able to step in when they should step in and help and protect that child's safety but otherwise the child knows best about their identity they always will and when i and what i'm saying is that they should not be outed they should only tell their parents what they are when they're able and ready to thank you My name is Michelle Philippin. I live at 2298 Lloyd Avenue in Fort Lee. Um, I want to say that I believe in you. I believe in all nine of the board members. I believe that if Cliffside Park, Edgewater, Leonia, Closter, Tenafly, if our neighboring districts are able to figure out the nuances and practicalities of this policy that we are so suddenly worried about, you can do it too. I believe in you. Um, they're not wasting their time on this, right? And they're not because they seem to understand that this policy is based on basic facts, like the fact that being a member of the LGBT community is not by default a mental health concern. <laughs> that the wraparound care of a strong and inclusive school community is exactly what we hope for all of our kids. That the necessity of speaking up and speaking out as the young person gravely before me just said is part of this policy that notifying parents if a child is being bullied is at risk of self-harm is somehow in danger is actually a part of the policy um that no one no teacher no principal no guidance counselor i know it wasn't said tonight but it was said at the last meeting no one is giving your child prescriptions or bringing them to the doctor please can we stop that madness <laughs> No one knows the practicalities of being in school with kids, with teachers. I love my students. I love my job so much, but teachers do not manage students' gender transitions. Please, we are underpaid as it is. That is not what this is. No one is knocking anyone's parenting by saying, hey, you know what? For some kids, school is a safer place than home. That just is the truth. Turn on the news. 
I'm a teacher with 16 years of experience. And if you want to talk about teacher vacancies, I have to tell you, I would not want to go near a board who is playing politics with children's civil rights and their safety. I would not want to teach in a town whose board of education cares more about playing with a right-wing political movement than following the best practice guidelines of this state. Woo! Candace and I'm on Westview Place. I find it very dangerous and inappropriate misrepresenting this policy as something that has the intention to keep secrets from parents. Whatever your fear is, I think we can logically remember this was passed by Governor Chris Christie and unless you think his administration and our current DOE is gunning for parents' rights, we know that just not to be true. This policy has been in place for almost a decade, like everybody has said, written by law firm, experts, and specialists. There was no issue here. There was no issue then. There's no issue now. And again, it's been in place for almost a decade. Regardless of what happens and how this goes down, I trust the teachers of Fort Lee to continue to protect all kids, even after the spectacle that you fell for. Teachers know that these kids and all kids need their parents and a safe home environment. We know this, and we don't ever seek to release, re replace that relationship. We are trying to do what we have always done, which is continue to create a space that is safe so students can learn. And if that child's fixation is on being worried that they're going to be outed or bullied, it's my job as a teacher to make sure they don't have to worry about that and can focus on math. This policy gives guidance on just that. A child tells a teacher that they want to be called by another name at school. Cool. Oh, wait a minute. Let's not re-traumatize them every time by calling attendance. By saying they're given name. Oh, but I don't, they're not just in my class. I see other teachers too. So how do I make sure I let other teachers know what their preferred name is? Will I be violating New Jersey's anti-discrimination law by creating a memo about this child that's singling them out? Wait, let me check 5756. Oh, phew, it says here that the school can create a file or record separate of their permanent and legal record, and I can record the preferred name so we do not re-traumatize them throughout the day and they can focus on learning. 5756 gives guidance on how not to influence our students, encourage or discourage, or remain a safe place as they work to figure this out. Honestly, let's play this out. You don't like this policy, you want more parent communication. So Timmy comes to school wearing a necklace. Is that a signal for me as a teacher? Do I start a process? Do I send home the letter to say your child is exhibiting gender confusion and must see a counselor? That to me seems far more involved than what 5756 in its current form is saying. Instead, I would like to say, Timmy, nice necklace. You can look up so we can do that. You are actually requiring more influence rather than allowing the child to just be who they are. Again, as before, I ask that you do not fall for this distraction and this path that takes us to Florida and allow 5756 to stand. Thank you. Does anyone else in the public who has not yet spoken wish to speak before we go to the Zoom participants? Okay, Mr. Ruggiero, you're up. Nahail, Nahail, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Uh, hi, Mihail Komonescu, 254 Tom Hunter Road. A uh, couple of things. I wasn't aware that we can bring random people from all over the state and the state next door to come to this meeting, so I should have been more prepared. And I wasn't aware that we can bring experts to the meeting either. So 
I ask the board before they make their decision to give me the opportunity to find a tr uh, the transitioner from somewhere and let them speak about regret. Because none of the experts so far have put forward the way of dealing with this thing when people have regrets about transitioning. None. There's no one capable of identifying kids that might regret it later. That's one thing. The other thing is I wasn't aware that we're allowed to be off camera when we speak to the board either. We had a at the last meeting, we had a number of testimonies from random people on the internet. I have an office full of parents that would gladly testify if they're off camera because they're afraid for their jobs because of the way in which the state legislator put forward that they're going to threaten or work with their employees to threaten their jobs. So in regards to the policy, I oppose any policy that seeks to keep me in the dark as a parent. From the moment that the child is... <laughs> We are not given the child home unless we have a car seat and the nurse goes to the practice of how to care for the child. If I don't report to the pediatrician, the pediatrician calls child services on me the minute that a certain time frame passes to check on the kid. And then I, get, I take the kid to school and same thing with the teachers. The teacher analyzes the kid, see if he's okay, see if he has some such and such. They ask about the kid's status and they will call child services if there's anything to the kid. From my perspective, there's no need for such a policy because if something happened to the kids, the, the school has everything in their power to notify the authorities and write it. Uh, on the other hand, me as a parent, I'm fully liable for the kid up until 18. If the kid does something bad, guess who's getting sued for damages? Not the kid, me as a parent. Therefore, it's in my right to be fully informed on what the kid does in school or anywhere elsewhere, because none of you will be responsible for these kids when they mess up. Oh, and by the way, about informing, how are you going to plan to do when something happens to the kid? Say the kid commits, tries to commit suicide at school. You're going to call me up and be like, hey, by the way, your kid is in the hospital. He tried to cut his hands. Your problem, deal with it. That's how it's going to go, right? Because we're not informed because it's going to go on the health record. In regards to the confusion in school about names, you wouldn't have this issue if there wouldn't be separate records. Now you got to go with the file around classes and try to figure out which kid is kid, and you're going to send reports from and you're going to mess it up. And we'll find out from the other parents and your mess ups. That's all. Sarah Q, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Sarah Q. Yes, hello, do you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, thank you. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Um, I just wanted to mention a few issues. The sidewalks on the around the intermediate and mi uh, middle school are deplorable. Uh, they are in full violations with local, state, and federal laws. The mayor is aware of it, and he said it's school's responsibility to fix them. Our kids are growing, and some of them are getting spinal um, issues because they need their shape table to be adjustable. We have eighth graders that are sitting on chairs and desks of second grades. So we need funding, and we need them as soon as possible. Now, as far as for the gender, 56 and 57 have to go and be removed and rooted out. The law of discrimination is the law of the land. Paula Colbert said it, and the judge in the appellate court, again, appellate court, not the lower courts, appellate court is the upper court in Trenton, New Jersey, said it that Everything has been handled. No one is here to discriminate any child because they feel like turtle or they feel like something else. The gender has been decided from the Almighty Lord when he created them. As far as for other issues, um, in, step, in, S, in CEPAC meetings, um, we want to participate and we want all to be rotated. Mr. Kravitz, if you ever see the same faces coming to your office, please let them know that the rest of the group in CIPAC meetings wants to participate. 
We didn't vote anyone to be a president in our group. We didn't vote for anyone to just be there all the time. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Abolish 56 and 57. I yield my time to the other parents. JPF, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. JPF. Hey, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. Uh, good evening. I'm Jay Paranata Freed, and I live on One Wall Street in the Coitsville section of Fort Lee. I have a daughter in first grade in the district and married to a man. I'm gay. I ask myself, <laughs> how often? How, <laughs> I ask myself very often, how many times do I come out to this community? It honestly feels like every day. I do it because it normalizes us. My family, who we are, and who will, will always be part of the LGBTQ community. Why am I choosing to come out to you again tonight? Because it's personal, and it's my choice to tell you. You may not believe that this is any for, for any preconceived notion about so, a sexual orientation or identity, but I have known that I was gay since I was in first grade. I've always felt different. I'm Filipino-American. I'm from an immigrant family. I'm part of a broken family. I was raised in part, this is a surprise for a lot of you, by two men, my uncle and his husband, who I call my dads. The list can go on for how I could feel other, but those are all outwardly seen traits. Being gay and identifying as such is personal and private. I met one of my best friends when we were minors. We went through a lot together, as most teens do. First loves, first heartbreaks, first jobs, first this, first that, first time coming out. Them bisexual, me gay. A lot of what we went through weren't always vetted through our parents because we had an understanding with one another. Let's not ignore the fact that friends and people not part of our immediate family are just easier to talk to, especially when you're growing up. Let's be honest, it's easier now as adults, speaking to our friends. I believe gender and fluid and gender is, and gender is fluid and gender is beautiful. Recently, this best friend that I just talked about came out to me as a trans woman. She might have felt this all her life, for all I know. But I was accepted into her bubble of safety and trust to self-identify who she really is 23 years after she started having those feelings. But I still accept her and I love her for who she is. Why do I share with this with you tonight? Because these issues that we're talking about, it talks about identity. 756 represents a safety net for people who are part of the LGBTQ community. It's about self-identification and safety. Look at me in my virtual eyes, y'all. <laughs> we gays will tell you when we're ready. Okay? I was ready to come out when I was six and 13 and 16 and 18 and 20 and 22 and 28 when I legally said yes to my now husband and 34 when I said, wow, I'm going to be a father. 40, I'm coming out again and on my own volition. And I'm here to tell you that the right thing to do is to keep this common sense policy in place because it works. Good night. <laughs> Mike, also, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Mike, also. Good evening, everyone. Mike, also, 230 Warren Avenue in Fort Lee. I'm at work. First thing I want to say, trying to push a policy is reckless. We should not be trying to pull a policy or amend a policy or revise a policy or add a policy at this moment in time, because the, the reality is the Attorney General Matt Placken will be suing this school district. That's the reality. And, and to all my board members that are trying to put your policy, you are not qualified professionally to handle this all by yourselves. So 
trying to write a policy is just as reckless as a teacher who has no qualifications handling these kind of situations. I am consistent constantly. So this board, I don't recommend reading a policy because you will be getting notified by the attorney general's office of the state. I'm sorry, but that's the truth. The next thing, a couple of things that need to be clarified. There are 24 school districts in this state that have rescinded policy 5756, and not one school district has been sued by the Attorney General Matt Placken regarding this, even Monday night in Ramapo Indian Hills Regional High School. And the list can, can, continues to go. To some of my fellow old board members out there, in 2015 and 2017, when I sat on that board and we voted on policy 5756, parental consent was mandatory. It was. It's the truth. You didn't have a problem with it then. Now you have a problem with it, right? So you got to always play to sit both sides of the fence. But think about it. Yeah, we sat and we had no problem with it because there was parental consent. <laughs> All right, so you can't play both sides of the fence. Next thing, I went to this board two to three straight meetings and asked for procedures regarding this. And all I got was, well, we're just following the law. There is no procedure in this school district. Your roles as board members is to minimize any possible liability the heck the superintendent in this school district has no accounting for anything and guess what when he gets sued his name will be put on there and you're blindsided him that's not right and me i can speak of a parent with two children with ieps if you don't tell me what's going on with my children with IEPs, you will be sued because it is the law to tell me. Period. Rescind policy 5756 because you have no procedures in place. And do not, do not try to put a new policy on because the school district We'll get sued by the attorney general. Slow it down and take it piece by piece. Thanks, everyone. Ben, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Ben? Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good evening. This is Ben Tang. I live on 435 Westview Place. First, I'd like to give uh, to share positive updates regarding my girl's substitute teacher situation that I raised last time. On Monday, I received an email from Mrs. Etra, who will be taking over for the remainder of the school year. She is one of the many beloved teachers in this district. My girl is eager to resume her learning journey under her guidance. I want to extend my heartfelt appreciation to the dedicated educators of Fort Lee who worked tirelessly in this unexpected yet understandable situation. Many teachers stepped in and helped. I'm especially grateful for the principal's transparency, explaining the process to both myself and the class. She wants the best for the kids. Once again, this reaffirms the deep core, deep care and dedication that Fort Lee educators have for our kids. Thank you. Now, now let's discuss the pressing concern, policy 57, which is taking up a lot of our taxpayer money right now. Kids says the darnest things. They express themselves with honesty and with an innocence, often without filters. They are still learning about the language and social norms. They are still children navigating their way through the complexities of the world. Do we need elaborate procedure and protocols, even involving expert psychologists in response to any innocent statement by children? 
As parents, our primary concern is the safety and well-being of our children. Yet, there comes a time when we must allow them room to explore and grow, even if it means letting them stumble along the way. It is through these experiences that they learn to navigate life's challenges and emerge stronger. Let's give the children the space to take risks, make mistakes, and learn from them. Policy 5756 was crafted by experts in this field. This is not a rushed decision. This is not the time for politics. This town voted overwhelmingly for Joe Biden, Phil Murphy, Josh Gottheimer, and Mark Sacklage. My wife, Amy Kotang, received the highest vote in this year's Board of Ed education election as well. This is a progressive town, and this town has consistently voted for inclusivity and diversity for all people. Put the politics aside and focus on protecting all the children. They are your constituents as well. This is the legacy you have for this town. Keep policy 5756 in place as is and make Fort Lee proud. Thank you. Leonid, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Leonid? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so this message, the first half of the message to the candidates from Fort Lee Strong, you will campaigning on parental rights. So we are asking you to keep your word, to keep your promise. And remember, you will vote it in. There are a lot more of us than people who are making noise in the cafetorium. And my next message is to the opposing group, uh, Forty Together. All I want is uh, if my child, who is with me, by the way, if she decides to use pronouns, I want to be notified. But you seem you and your supporters seem to be to have issue with that. So I'm not going to ask you what issue you have because I know what issue you have. I'm going to ask you to mind your own business. My family, my family and friends is none of your business. And I hope uh, I made myself very clear. That's it for me. And my daughter. Karina, Karina, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Karina. Karina, you're still muted. Karina? All right, there you go. Karina, are you there? All right, Karina, I'm gonna put you back with the attendees. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hand again and I'll put you in the queue. Tracy. Hello. Oh, um, hello, hello, sorry, I had to reload. This is Karina. Go ahead, yes. Uh, I, I, I apologize for that. Um, hello, um, Karina Manukian, 54 Virginia Avenue. I would like to read what my friend has to say because she was not able to say what she had. To, like, <laughs> When your child comes out to you as gay or trans, you don't tell them that you love them no matter what. But um, um, and yes, there is nothing. Your child 
children are afraid of coming out because of the expect of what the reaction of their parents might be and this is especially dangerous for trans teens because um of the because of the amount of danger of being trans at home it is shown by studies that 41% of trans people commit suicide it is higher than any other members of lgbtq community by removing this policy you are causing danger to um all those trans students in our school. I have trans friends and I would not like them to be put into any harm because of removal of this policy. And um, <laughs> so I'm, it's, it, it's not fair to just re to remove someone's rights to their pronouns and their gender. I understand from parents that you want to know what's going on with your child. I understand that. However, someone's gender and sexuality, is, it's, it's theirs. They don't have to tell you right now. They can tell you when they're ready. Thank you. Tracy M. You've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Tracy M. Hi, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, my name is Tracy Moore. Um, I live at 251 Maple Street. Um, I am a senior at Fort Lee High School, and I am currently the uh, president of PRISM, which is also known as the GSA at Fort Lee High School. Um, um, I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person, um, but I'm here right now. Before I begin, I would just like people to know, because I know that there have been accusations in the past that students have been told by faculty um, what to say. I'm nearly an adult. So I am here, um, my free will, I'm doing this because I am president of PRISM and I have dedicated my time to protect queer and trans students, just like the board is supposed to protect all students of Fort Lee. Um, I would just like to say that I'm very disappointed that you guys would want to repeal policy 5756. This has been protecting so many trans youth within Fort Lee. Um, I feel like it's very important for several of you to understand that Fort Lee includes a town, is a town where so many people from different cultures um, come from. And unfortunately, within those cultures, a lot of those people are not accepting of the LGBTQ plus community. I have met several people where they have been put into arranged marriages, they have been sent back to their home countries, and a lot of you may think that's illegal. Well, a lot of things are illegal and they still happen. It's really important that you all know that your children are not your property. You have the privilege to know what your children are feeling and they have the, uh, they have the option to tell you. Unless your child is in danger, of course, the staff is not going to tell you what they're feeling inside. So please, do not ever say that the staff of Fort Lee has not done enough because they have. And a lot of them are in the audience, in person, telling you that they are here to protect their students. I would also like to ask parents before I end, why is it that you want to know if your child is trans? Is it because you want to be educated or is it because you want to send them to a conversion therapy? If you really love your child, you would just let them be as they are. There should not be an quote unquote emergency for this to be discussed because it is not an emergency and it is not a mental health issue. It is just their identity. So I am not asking you, I am telling you, do not repeal policy 575. Thank you so much for your time.
Bria, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Priya. Hi, good evening. Can every can everyone see me and hear me? We can hear you. Can't see you, but we can hear you. Priya Patel, 2414 Second Street. Good evening, um, board members. I just want to take a moment to thank and appreciate all those students who spoke at the BOE meetings and penned the anonymous letters to the BOE. To those students, your courage and words are truly inspiring. Thank you for reminding me that parenting is a beautiful journey. Thank you for reminding me, me that in the process of raising kids, parents also have the opportunity to raise themselves, raise themselves to be better, to do better. Thank you for reminding me that policy 5756 is not at odds with parents. It's essentially an extension of what parents do, which is to love, accept, and offer a safeguard a substitute in case kids feel more comfortable in expressing themselves first to someone else other than the parent themselves. Thank you for reminding me of what a true community does. A true community loves, supports, and looks after each other. Dear board members, please don't put Fort Lee back a decade in terms of basic civil rights. Our kids deserve to be heard and protect us. They are the true beneficiaries of policy 5756. Don't try to fix something that is working just fine. Let's leave it intact and leave it alone. Thank you. Ali, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Ali. Um, hello, my name is Amina. This is my second time speaking for this reappealing policy. The protection for our queer youth is not meant to be a wedge between parental rights or between familial responsibility and relationships. This is meant to ensure we stay safe and help focus on our education, which is what's important, without the threat of constantly being overwhelmed or outed without our consent. If your child isn't comfortable telling you, stripping us of this critical right will only drive more distance between you and them. My proposition is to shift the attention from reappealing this law to instead nurturing a safer environment and working with your resources and counselors we have on board to communicate in better ways with your kids. Extend, extend your effort into dealing with more pressing matters and address the root cause of the seeming distrust they have for you. When one latches onto the idea of the threat of parental rights, when in reality there is no such threat to that area, it begs the question if you really are concerned about parental rights or the control of your kids. Do you care more about repression or our safety? Being trans doesn't mean immediate transitions or surgical changes, does not mean going under operations or black market testosterone. Those who are not educated on our lives should not make crucial decisions for our safety. There is a reason why therapists and mental professionals do not tell everyone the details of their patient regarding their identity. It is their right and against the law. In the same sense, mental health professionals in an educational environment should not be required to notify anyone of their identity, identity because there is no way that they can be somehow a risk. I'm telling you, please, to not, re to not reappeal 5756. Thank you for your time. Aslar, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Aslar. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Uh, so um, I was at the last meeting and I'm not really prepared because I wasn't really planning on speaking today, but I heard a parent calling me out earlier and sort of made me upset 
So I did not change my name in the school system. I don't know why that person would think that changing my name is unacceptable because, you know, some people go by different names, like Alex, short for Alexander. But other than that, um, I dislike my name purely for the meaning, not because of anything else. It's because of what my name means. <laughs> and... I would like to say that I know a friend that was accidentally outed to their parents and their parents abused them for it. They hid the bruises really well, but a teacher heard them talking about it to friends. So um, so basically CPS was called, but, um, but their parents forced them to lie to CPS and they now moved out of the country but I still worry about them every single day if I'm outed especially by m any of my educators I have a risk of being kicked out I have a risk of being verbally abused I know that many students will have it worse but I was shunned when I mentioned like alternate genders to my parents and I would like to ask, why do parents need to know everything about their kids? If their kids don't feel safe with telling their parents something, it is for a reason. I want to make it clear that even if we're deemed as kids, we have our own minds and we will always know ourselves better than anyone else, especially as a teen. I know my parents will not handle it well if I was out to them. And I get that parents want to know what is going on with their kids but is an but it is an invasion of privacy for our teachers and counselors to tell our parents our sexuality and anything else that is not in risk for us harming ourselves and what about all the safe space stickers and all the signs across the school and like all around our school buildings, like are the teachers being required to put that there? No, the teachers support us. We should be able to express ourselves freely to the people we are comfortable with. But by removing the 5756 policy, our students will not be safe. And yeah, I'm done. Our students will not be safe. That's all I wanna say. Diana Ladd, you've been promoted to panelists. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Diana, you're still muted. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, I'm Diana Loud. I'm the psych teacher at Fort Lee High School, and I'm the very proud advisor of the Fort Lee High School Prism Club. I just wanted to... I'm a nervous speaker, but I thought that it was really important for me to be here tonight supporting my students. I am so very proud of all of you for speaking up and speaking about what is right, human rights. All you students have given me hope for the future. I wanted you to all know that you are fantastic and I appreciate you. I am a teacher and my responsibility is to protect and care for each of my students as if they were my own. And that's what I will do. I will fight tooth and nail to do what is best for these young people. My daughter is five years old. And if she didn't feel comfortable for any reason coming out to me, but felt trust with a teacher or a school member, so be it. At least she has a trusted adult to talk to. Her life and keeping her safe is way more important than my ego as a parent. Keep 5756. Hey, Oju, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Hey, Oju. 
Hello, I'm outside the building right now with my friend since I can't join in person. Um, policy 5756. I think that um, if this gets re repealed, the public has been saying this over and over again, and they've been telling the board members how much they don't want this to get repealed. Knowing everything about your kid is not a pri is a privilege, not a right, and it only comes with parents actually talking to the children and creating an environment where they feel safe to talk to you. If you want to know things about your kids, you have to talk to them and make them feel safe enough to talk to you about like these things. Um, oh, people bring up these hypothetical situations to diminish these concerns that we have about repealing policy 5756. I don't think anyone in Fort Lee would go as a turtle. Um, I think these hypothetical situations, they're only making them up to back up their cause, which says a lot. The perception of parental rights is misconstrued, and some kids just don't feel safe telling their parents that they're trans, and that's understandable. But if this policy gets repealed and a kid is outed, then that just escalates the situation and puts the child at risk and danger in their home. Fort Lee is supposed to be a safe place, but this doesn't make it feel very safe because not every student is in a loving and supporting environment. You can't say that every single parent in Fort Lee is supportive and makes their children feel safe. That's just not. To the board members, please make your vote based off what the public is telling you. All these emails that you've been getting, the petitions that are being made, all these different things, they're for a reason. The people want to keep the policy. They don't want it to get repealed because lives are at stake. Like this is really detrimental to trans people. And um, I just think that it'd be best if it was kept. Listen to us. Please listen to us. There are so many people telling you this. Please make your decision based off what the people want because they've been telling you this over and over and they've been sending emails and and posting up outside because they couldn't join the actual in-person thing please just listen to please listen we're outside in the cold right now cold as hell for <laughs> this is really cold outside give her my freaking jacket like <laughs> we're standing outside in the cold right now because like we want to speak in this we really don't want this to get repealed. Please, please listen. This is very important. And I think the trans people at, in Fort Lee deserve to feel safe and protected. <laughs> Thank you for, lis for listening to my yapping. Diana B, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Diana B. Hi, uh, I'm Diana Borelli. Uh, I live in 2000 Linwood Avenue, Fort Lee, New Jersey. Um, I am a master's of social work student. I think we should be having this conversation based on sound research and science. One of our loudest voices in town against the policy has been saying on social media in recent days, that being transgender is a mental issue. I wanted to make sure that everyone in the, this room understands that being transgender is not a mental health condition. <laughs> it, is, it is the opinion of the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychological Association, the American School Counselor Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the National Institute of Health, the National Association of School Psychologists, um, and I could go on, but I would like to also share um, within the Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is the fifth edition text resolution that we use, um, rates of suicidality and suicide, excuse me, um, attempts for transgender individuals are reported to range from 30 to 80 percent with risks factors including past maltreatment, gender victimization, depression, substance abuse, and younger age. Also, gender nonconformity may appear at all ages after the first two to three years of childhood and may interfere with daily activities. Um, 
these individuals who do not have access to health services and mental health services may be impeded by structural barriers. Hostility towards working with this patient pop pop population has to be very careful. Thank you very much. Albert, Albert Swang, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Albert. Hey, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, uh, I'm Albert. Um, I wasn't planning to call in, but I, I heard of a lot of stories tonight that really touched my heart. So I might as well just say a couple of thoughts that I had in my mind. So I don't really have anything prepared on this. Um, I just want to understand, you know, I've kind of been following board of ed meetings here and there, but I just don't understand like why now, like why now are we doing this? I just don't understand why, you know, in some of the previous meetings we're talking about sex ed, now it's talking about this, but it just seems like a coincidence that this is the hottest trending topic right now on Facebook. So are we setting policy by what's people talking about on social media? So because of that is, this has nothing to do specifically with Fort Lee because I've listened to all these stories and I don't hear anything that has specifically happened in my town. Like there hasn't been anything. But now it just seems like we're following a trend today. This is this policy. Tomorrow it's that policy. And then whatever is the fighting for, it's going to be that policy. But so many kids tonight have came out and spoke. And I am deeply touched by their stories. So are we going to listen to their stories and like communicate and talk to them and do something about it? Because I think we need to do that because this is a Fort Lee Board of Ed system. This is not every like this is specifically to our town and we need to listen to what they're saying so that's all i really have to say is that we need to focus our priorities so i just again over and over now again i don't understand why we just follow a trend when we set when we are setting these policies and another concern i have is like when i look at the policies on our fort lee page you know five seven uh Five seven five six. There's what one title for this policy, one word, and it's transgender. By removing this policy, we're saying they don't exist, which is wrong, which is very wrong. You can't remove that word in our policy. How does it hurt us just to have this word? It's the word transgender. It doesn't matter the content, what's in it, just to have that word and saying they exist is all it matters to me that this word needs to stay in the policy. You can't remove that. So thank you so much for your time. And that's all I had. There are no more raised hands of attendees that haven't spoken already. <laughs> You see one that hasn't spoken yet, Michelle Perez. Michelle Perez, you've been promoted to panelist. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Hi, everybody. Here we are again. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> I am Michelle Perez, 555 North Avenue. Let's close the evening. So some of the arguments in favor of repealing or changing policy 5756 involve half-truths and red herrings. Amending is not a good idea. It might be the only thing I ever agree with on Mickey also. Example, <laughs> the first school district where the board, didn't where the board did repeal 5756 and then amended its own version was sued by the state. The court stated the Hanover district's amended version would cause harm and infringe on civil liberties. The court also stated there's no infringement on the constitutional rights of parents in the 2019 version of policy 5756, which is what we have had in place for the past five years. So policy 5756 has so far caused no harm in Fort Lee and we've had it as is for five years. Look, it is not a mental health issue. You've heard this all night. It's a civil rights issue. 
Although outing a child or adult against one's will could cause a mental health issue and violate that individual's civil rights at any age, not just middle school or high school students. And it also does not have to be mandatory to be the right thing to have in place. The philosopher Seneca wrote, there is no right way to do the wrong thing. The right thing is to listen to the American Psychological Association, National Education Association, American Academy of Pediatrics, UNESCO, and many others that agree 5756 is beneficial in its current form. There are organizations that this board normally would deem respectable and heed their expertise. Why not now? Our school district peers in Bergen County all have 5756 in place, as is. And a lot of them also use Genesis for record keeping. They are not focusing on this issue. Why are we here tonight? My hope is that maybe because this board has heard from the public and some of you have had time to reconsider your position. It is an honorable thing to change an opinion based on facts and not a political agenda. It is not a sign of weakness. It's actually intellectual maturity. The opening sentence of the policy says, quote, the Board of Education is committed to providing a safe, supportive, and inclusive learning environment for all students, end quote. That, that right there, that is a central part of your job. It's even in this policy. It's not minimizing liability. It is providing a safe, supportive, and inclusive learning environment for all students. But I've noticed how some of you have voted down a few curriculum agenda items in the past two years that were for diversity, equity, and inclusion training not giving any reasons for doing so, and correcting each other in the middle of a roll call vote to ensure it failed. Don't believe me? Check the videotape. So tonight, I ask you to do your job well. Leave this policy as is and approve supporting DEI curriculum in the future because there is no right way to do the wrong thing. Do not modify it, do not repeal it, and please stop bringing this up. Leave 5756 as is and do your job to provide a safe, supportive, and inclusive learning environment for all our students. And thank you to our teachers. We appreciate you. Margarita Vigodner, you've been promoted to panelists. Please unmute your microphone and feel free to share your video. Please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes. Margarita Vigodner. Hello? Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, all right. I didn't write speeches. It, it seems like everyone, everything was written. People even re repeated the same sentences. I noticed some similarities, uh, the same phrases in some of the, um, you know, speeches. Anyway, um, I don't, I have not really seen uh, people calling uh, transgender people um, uh, being, uh, having a mental disorder. I never seen that. Um, I saw that parents and the board member, because they love uh, our LGBTQ community, worry about uh, their he mental health, the health of the small children, and they are worried about having this issue between a child and the teacher. Uh, there was some mentioning that there are some therapies at schools, but it doesn't have, it can be just between the teacher and the child. And the teacher is not a therapist. So there is really a big concern about the mental health issue. And the parents are notified only when there is a risk, you know, to the to the child's li life. But, but, and that can be too late, you know? So that's, that's really my concern. Uh, we just want to know that the students exist. Come on, we have proud events, we have Prisma Club, we have rainbows all around Fort Lee. We don't need like, you know, a policy to remember we have those students. But my understanding that the town is very divided and several board members came together and trying to find a common ground. My understanding is that they basically keep the policy with some minor changes. They want to take small kids out of it and maybe like to strengthen the, uh, the, 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 you know, the mental uh, concerns a little more. So that I don't understand why cannot we give it a chance and review this policy to find a common ground. Um, nobody looked at it. I actually applaud a transgender man who came and said, leave the little kids out of it. Look at their policy because <laughs> 
several people and, and community members kind of like go back and forth and discuss how to find a common ground in this very divided town. So I think we have to give it a chance and see if it can be acceptable by the majority. Um, and again, of course, you know, uh, uh, many, many parents don't speak. They're behind the screen. So the board members have to do what is the best for majority of parents and the majority of, of children. Not only those who attended, uh, you know, the meeting in person. Thank you so much. There are no more raised hands. So. Okay, may I have a motion to close the floor to the public? Welcome. Motion will test second night. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, moving on to resolutions. Um, we need to talk Normally we don't do this, Jeff you know, but I don't really care and it's probably the only time I'm going to see you there. So I just want to say how proud I am of my son who came. Of something that he put forth in Fort Lee High School because he was the one that did the petition to get um, the, the club started and everything, even though he had some people that were against him to be put forward and he got it done. And I can't tell you how proud I am of you, and you're definitely a better job than I'll ever do. Okay, moving on um, to the you only position. I'm hearing a lot of back. She's, she's, no, she's, I've been having computer problems. I think I may be signed in on two different computers. I'm not sure. Okay, so moving on, um, there is only one resolution on the agenda. So do I have a motion to approve item one POL? I'm making a motion to table it pending review of the revised policy. So the motion currently on the table is to table one POL in order to discuss and review the proposed revision. Could, could everyone use their mics? For some reason I had to sign back in and I can't hear. Yeah, can we motion to just vote on it tonight on this policy first? If I may, just number one, I just ask members of the public to please refrain from interrupting the meeting. Uh, the public participation section of the meeting is over. Um, we appreciate that. Um, number two, can we turn the lights on? <laughs> uh, and number three, board members, excuse me, there's been a motion that's been properly moved and seconded. Uh, the motion to the table, the resolution, uh, and refer to the policy committee uh, for further review and study. Um, that motion was made uh, and seconded. Um, so now it's discussion on that motion. Um, so we have to do a vote on that particular motion. Um, any other items depending on the outcome? Can I ask a question? Sure. Does that We're motion? So this is, I'll turn it back over to the president. It's been moved, seconded, discussion. I just want to understand does that motion come before what's on paper? Is there, like, is there an order, second order of? They can say can we vote on is there a reason why we not vote on what's on the agenda first and then hope accept new addition? We I think the, the president did get resolutions. May I have a motion to approve item one POL? That's the only item on the agenda. So do we do we vote on that first? Before we, we got to that, I made a motion. Oh, oh, oh sorry, that. It, the motion no, was, the, I'm sorry, so the, the motion was to table the item. So technically, you're voting on that item. Correct. Yeah. Correct. 
just want to make the differentiation. Once we table it, do we just need one more vote to abolish it, or do we go back to the scratch board and start from scratch again? Okay, so, so again, so if you if you table it pursuant to your board uh, bylaw, um, I think it's zero one three one, I believe it is. We referred to it before. Um, in order to adopt a new uh, uh, bylaw or policy, which this is a new policy three three one nine. We'll straight that. So you're basically your the the motion on the table is to table the second reading of the policy that's being my motion was to table one pol, which is referring Correct. to five seven five six. Correct five seven five six because it doesn't say here. That's why I got confused. I'm sorry. Um, so you've already had the first reading of it. This is the second reading of to abolish five seven five six. If you table it. Uh, it will still be the second reading the next time it is brought forward to abolish. Um, so again, what, you're, what I heard earlier, this is three hours ago now, the conversation was to table 5756 to allow the policy committee ample time to review policy 3319. But you're only talking about the, the, I'm sorry, do the two need to be linked? Abolish of one and the review of the other are they two not two independent events so they are two independent votes and two independent policies however the motion that was made was to the table now arguably if you made your motion first then we would vote on that first but that wasn't made first because the motion was i table. lost my jeopardy buzzer sorry guys <laughs> sorry, so, again, so from a procedural standpoint roberts was a order standpoint which are the procedures this board follows uh, you've got a motion to table the matter, uh, policy 5756, the uh, second reading of the abolishment, um, that will in turn give the committee time to review that in conjunction with the proposed new policy. Um, if you need or want more time, you can address that at the appropriate time. Uh, but right now, the motion on the floor is to table this Just for Okay, states, however, correct? in tabling the matter, because this is not working and my voice counts. <laughs> so in tabling this, we're only talking about tabling it to the next meeting, which is Monday. So generally speaking, pursuant to Roberts was a border, um, I always, I've always advised this board that you're not Congress, right? So we don't have to make things super technical. Um, <laughs> technically speaking, pursuant to Roberts was a border, when a matter is moved, uh, was, is put on the quote unquote table, you're supposed to set forth a specific time frame when you anticipate bringing it back to the body. So it is procedurally appropriate to make the motion to table it for review by the policy committee on Monday, March 18th. Now, Monday, March 18th, if there are more questions, more discussion, et cetera, nothing says that it has to come off the table at that meeting. You can continue to postpone it for future review, study analysis, et cetera. Suppose we don't want to kick the can down the line because we can't afford to have these special meetings all the time. How do we make this? Um, how, procedurally, how do we make that happen tonight? We've got a motion that's been properly moved and seconded on the floor to table this item until at least Monday, March 18, 2024. The vote yes or you can vote no? Um, if you vote so no, if, if you vote no, let's just say the vote comes out 5 4, not to table. And it's still here tonight and someone can make a motion to approve it or to reject it or whatever you want to do. Um, but if it gets a majority of members present and voted to table it, then it's effectively tabled. And you well, can vote again tonight. I'm going to send you a link. Sorry, what was that? Sorry, I don't My internet is not good. Any other questions? Right, on the uh, motion to table uh, policy 5756, which is one POL. I have a question, Mr. Lester, uh, Mr. Yes, Taylor. Uh, so if the item is tabled, um, the policy that we have um, protecting the students stays in place as is? And so as I said before, the, the current policy as it's written is in place, yes. Um, even without the policy in place, the Fort Lee Board of Education, the Fort Lee School District has an obligation to comply with the federal and state law of disability. Discrimination as a disability, I'm sorry. 
Anyone else have questions? Is a transgender student covered under that policy? Every person in this school district is uh, covered by the provisions okay. of the federal I, I just need you to sign on with a different issue. Okay, so motion currently on a table made by Ms. Colbath, seconded by Mr. Knight, was to table um, the agenda item one POL, which would be abolishing policy 5756 upon further review and discussion of the proposed revisions and Go to creation of 3399. <laughs> So we'll happen, but please go to his emails. Come back to me, please. Paula, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm having very bad Wi Fi, but yes. Okay, hold on. She's doing roll call now. Miss Colbach. Yes. Miss Carter. Yes. Mr. Knight. Yes. Miss Cote. No, because I want to end this tonight. Say my name? Yes. Mr. Lopez. No. <laughs> He's going to dad's emails. No, if he didn't give me his password. I don't know. This, yeah. is his, this is mine. This is his. This is okay. Um, yeah. You guys. You guys. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. We're technically out of the discussion period, but from a procedural standpoint, board members can vote yes, no, they can vote no, or they can abstain. Now, just so you're clear, just because we're clear, if you abstain, the motion will still fail. Um, and then there can be another motion to approve it or disapprove it this evening. Um, if you can't, so you can vote yes, no or abstain. You don't have to state your reason for any of those items. Okay, Mr. The motion on the table is to wait and have the policy committee look at the policy. Well, technically, it's not so much to look at. Five seven five six. As I understand it, the, the, they're tabling it pending review of three three one nine. That's generally the, the gist of what the intent is, as I understand it. So that again, as stated before, so that there won't be a void of having no policy that covers the issue, whether you agree or disagree with, with what either policy says. Yes. Motion carries is five to four. Okay, I have a motion to adjourn the public meeting. Motion. Okay. Motion Morrell, second Rubino. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you everyone for coming. Aye.